Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to, to call the planning meeting to order. And uh, we have the members of council here. We have regrets from Councillor McIntyre and the chair, Rob Bosworth. And uh, we have um, Mayor Kelly, Councillor Nishikawa, Councillor Roberts, Councillor Mazin, Councillor Zavitz, Councillor Wire Kent, and Councillor Burry. The staff that are here are uh, David Pink, Director of uh, Development Services and Environmental Sustainability. Laura Tazak, Clerk, Derek Hammond, CAO, Brian Sharp, Manager of Planning, Sam Soya, Senior Planner, Emily Crowder, Planner, C. Chilvers, Planning Service Assistant, and Myers Thompson, Planning Clerk. And uh, I got to address Sally Munger, can I see her? She's here. Oh, she she is, yeah, back. okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and um, and if you would like to make comment, you can send it in on the following email uh, address, planning at muskokalakes.ca. Today's meeting is being live streamed and recorded on the Township of Muskoka Lakes website and YouTube channel. By participating in the open meeting today, you are consenting to your image, voice, and comments being recorded and posted online. Uh, there's no supplementary agenda. And uh, are there any uh, pecuniary interests? Oh, Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. Yes, I'm gonna excuse myself from discussions pertaining to agenda item 5D3, Kennedy, um, my very close relative, is the agent for the applicant, and I will complete the form. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Let me just go over some minor rules. Um, invited delegates, those who registered to speak prior to the posting of the agenda, item four, uh, you have five minutes to speak and you will be timed. Those who wish to speak during one of the legislative public meetings pursuant to the Planning Act 5, public, public meetings are permitted five minutes to speak. Pre-registered is not required. Those who wish to provide public comments or on any meeting agenda other than the legislative public meetings must register to speak by 9 a.m. on Tuesday prior to the meeting, and they will be included in the supplementary agenda. Public comments are permitted two minutes to speak. Pre-registration is required. And the planner will introduce the application, the applicant or applicant's agent, those who wish to support the application, those in opposition to the application, rebut by the applicant or applicant's agent, and there'll be committee questions. And the motions have been pre-populated with random movers and secondaries to expedite the meeting. Voting by members shall physically raise their hands until the chair has confirmed the vote. If this vote is unclear, a verbal vote will be recorded by the secretary. This is not a recorded vote. Okay, and uh, now we'll go to the first application, and that is uh, B4521ML Hall, and uh, the planner is Ms. Walker. Thank you, Chair Edwards, and good morning, everyone. The first application to be heard today is consent application B-45-22ML and zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA-04-23 bylaw 2023 016 in the name of Hull. The subject property is known municipally as R8 Island, North Bohemia. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted consent sketch starting on page 32 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is summarized as follows. A severance application has been submitted to create one new lot. 
The severed lot contains a dwelling and a dock. The retained lot contains a sleeping cabin, a dwelling, other land-based accessory structures and buildings, a single story boathouse and an associated dock. No do, new development is proposed on either lot at this time. Bylaw 2023-116 will have the effect of permitting an existing dock and a single story boathouse on the retained lot to have a cumulative width of 178 feet and 113 feet, 0.5 feet, 113.5 feet respectively. Staff note that an error was made on the circulated notice. Um, the notice was, the notice indicated the existing boathouse had a width of 93.5 feet when the actual correct width is 113.5 feet. Notice of this meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 21 days in advance of today's meeting and five submissions have been received today. They are summarized as follows. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the Township's Chief Building Official, Tim Sopko, the Township's Public Works Technician, Curtis Savret, Planner for the District of Muskoka, Hydro One, and the Trillium Lakelands District School Board. These submissions were each circulated to committee prior to today's meeting, and I'm happy to read any submission in full at the request of committee. A uh, detailed planning report has been prepared. If committee is considering approval of consent application B slash 46 slash 22 ML, in addition to the standard conditions of approval, staff have recommended the following. First, that a zoning exemption be approved to permit an existing over with dock and single story boathouse on the retained lot. And second, that the applicant enter into a consent agreement with the township pursuant to section 5126 of the Planning Act Said agreement shall be registered against the title of the lands and contain provisions to the satisfaction of the township where by the owner agrees to first, if a new septic, if a new sewage system is required on the severed lot to use soils that have demonstrated ability to effectively retain phosphorus or equivalent septic abatement technologies, which may include the use of soils with appropriate elemental composition to bind phosphorus or pre slash post treatment phosphorus controls over the long term. Two, not to utilize public parking and docking facilities as the principal means of access to the retained and severed lots. And three, that adequate long term parking and docking facilities used to access the severed lot be secured at all times. The full list of recommended conditions can be found in the staff report. Staff have recommended that zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 04 slash 23 bylaw 2023 116. 16 Hall be approved subject to the following minor amendments. First, to permit the cumulative single story boathouse width of 113.5 feet on the retained lot. Two, to replace Schedule 2 to Bylaw 2023-16 with an updated zoning sketch. Three, to restrict the maximum permitted cumulative dock width on the severed lot to 50 feet. And four, to restrict the maximum permitted cumulative single story boathouse width on the severed lot to 37 feet. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And do we have the uh, applicant or applicant's agent here? No one here? No, sorry. Good morning, members of the committee. Can everyone hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, good morning. Uh, my name is Graham Heisinger, uh, planner with Tullock Engineering in Huntsville, Ontario, 80 Main Street West, P1H1W9. Um, I'm here on behalf of David and Marilyn Hall, the owners of the uh, subject lands. And uh, first off, I'd like to thank staff for working with us. It's been uh, quite a bit of back and forth to get to this point. So it's it's great that it's um, before committee today. Um, I think staff did a good job summarizing the application and um, uh, you know obviously I, I believe that it uh, represents good planning the the purpose of the consent in the first place is basically just a family planning issue um, the owners of the property are you know they, they've had these two legal non-conforming dwellings on the property they're thinking long term how can they you know, you know kind of dispense of them to their family um, and this seemed like a logical break point in the property to split the two legal non-conforming dwellings and you know, in doing so, rectify an existing zoning non-compliance issue um, and also create a new lot for their family. Um, 
Regarding the shoreline structures, uh, as, as uh, staff mentioned, they're uh, large, but they've been there for quite some time. So we're basically just recognizing existing structures um, and as kind of a caveat or a trade off to um, recognizing these existing larger structures, we are uh, willing to reduce the maximum permitted width of the uh, shoreline development if it ever occurs on the severed lot um, to, to much less than would ordinarily be permitted. So I, I think that's a fair trade off and that in that way, you know, the shoreline of that uh, side of the island won't end up being overwhelmed by shoreline development. Um, yeah, that's uh, I think it's a reasonable proposal and I'm happy to answer any questions committee might have. So thank you very much for your time this morning. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in support of this application? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Other uh, questions from the committee? Uh, yes, Councillor Kent. Um, thank you very much. And through you, Mr. Graham. Graham. I Just one question, and I, maybe I didn't see it in the material. When were these original properties built, the five slip boathouse? I don't have the exact date uh, through you, That's Mr. Chair. I don't have the exact date, but I, I believe they're about 50 years old. So it's it's been there for quite some time. Because they look sort of modern. That's the only reason I ask. Well, I'm sure they've been spruced up a little bit over the years. But the, yeah, the original construction date was uh, predates the zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you. Okay, any other questions? No. Do we have a resolution? Moved by Councillor Burry, second by Councillor Zavitz. Be it resolved, the Planning Committee recommends to the Township Council that consent application E4522 ML Hall be provided with the subject to the following conditions. One, that a satisfactory description deed of the severed lot together with any required right of way or easement be submitted to the township along with any with a registered copy of the reference plan to the confirmation be received that the township is satisfied that the retained and severed lots are satisfactory for on-site sewage disposal and that any problems identified with the existing sewage system be corrected to the satisfaction of the township and or that the applicant enter in a consent agreement with the township pursuant to section 5126 of the Planning Act. Said agreement shall be registered against the title of the lands and contain provisions for satisfact to the satisfaction of the township, whereby the owner agrees, one, that a new sewage system is required on the severed lot to use soils that have demonstrated ability to effectively retain phosphorus and equivalent septic absorbent technology and which may include the use of soils with approximate elemental composition, not to utilize public parking and docking facilities as a principal means of access to the retained and severed lot and that adequate long-term parking and docking facilities used to access the severed lot be secured at all times that a zoning exemption be approved to permit an existing over the width dock and single story boathouse on the retained lot. I guess that's it. Are there any questions or comments? Uh, yes, Councillor Kent. This is now discussion time. Yes, it is. Um, I guess I am. Um... I understand the family planning aspect of this application. However, this again falls into, we've now, since I, my short tenure here, I've seen three or four of these applications where I feel that the severances and the proposed activity that's now being asked for, they're, they're being able to get away with a lot more than they might necessarily have gotten if the rules were set in place today. And in hindsight, yeah, it's 2020, they're asking for something, they've got a five slip boathouse that is significantly oversized in today's world. I don't understand why either, you know, why they should be allowed to 
sever and then get more boating and more boathouse frontage. It just makes no sense when the laws would not allow it uh, without rectifying the existing old boathouse situation. I would suggest that, I mean, I don't, I don't like it. I know there's no bad intention here, but again, why are we giving them permission to build another boathouse? They're gonna sever, they're gonna get their nice lots. They're gonna put the, lot, the, the buildings on two separate lots, which allows for family planning. But I don't see, given that the one boathouse, five slips is substantially oversized and the docking frontage is substantially oversized, why they should also get, even if it's 50 feet rather than 75 feet, an additional single story boathouse. It's just onerous on the shoreline and it's um, in violation of the technical rules. So without rectifying the existing boathouse, I don't think there should be a second boathouse. Anyway, those are my comments. It's the same creeping takeover with overbuilding that we've seen in three separate applications prior to this one. Thank you for your, your comments. Do you have anything else? Okay. Is there, uh, Mr. Chart, would you like to explain that with the, the size? It is uh, cutting down to 50 feet from 75, I believe, on the, the new lot, which we normally do. That brings it more into uh, conformity. For you, Chair Edwards, thank you. And uh, these are great comments. Um, Councillor Kent, I would just note that in this particular instance, what is proposed, as we know, is a, a lot creation proposal. And the existing lot, the parent lot, as it is, um, contains uh, a dock and a boathouse that appear to be legal non-complying that are significantly over width. And, you know, staff struggled uh, with that. However, um, recognizing that the lot creation uh, will confer some development rights to the newly created lot, that is the severed lot, staff felt it appropriate to compensate for the overwith shoreline structures on the retained lot by restricting the permitted widths on the severed lot. Um, so if there were no restrictions in place, um, what would be permitted is a dock 75 feet in width on the severed lot and a boathouse 75 feet in width on the severed lot, two stories. Um, so I think you know what we've recommended is a restriction on the total cumulative dock width on the severed lot to 50 feet and a restriction on the width of the uh, of a permitted uh, single story boathouse to 37 feet. And I think we're, we're comfortable uh, with that. Um, I'm happy to elaborate or um, answer any other questions if needed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharp. Yes, Councilor Kent. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. I just, for, for the record, I actually think that it's inappropriate to give it's going to be owned by the same family and they're not changing anything besides doing family planning. Um, I would hate to see another boathouse, whether it be 50 feet or 75 feet on the property when they're over, they're oversized as it is. And I just think it's, we're giving them what I think is outside of the bylaws. I understand you can find a good planning rationale for doing it, but uh, you know, rules are rules. And, um, you know, the boat at the second cottage is very close to the shoreline. And you're now going to put a boathouse, potentially, very close to the shoreline, you know, on the shoreline there. And it's all going to be more visually unattractive to the township than it than it was originally. They have a dock, they have a boathouse. If you're going to sever it, fine, sever it. I wouldn't give them the uh, extra boathouse, even if it's allowed, they're asking. Sorry, they're asking for the request, and I don't think you have to give uh, extensions or make amendments that um, violate the bylaw. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, you want to speak? Sure. Oh, I have to. Uh, thank you, uh, through you. What may assist uh, Councillor Kent uh, understanding is just. Uh, in simple numbers, if the property was currently vacant and two lots were proposed, it would be permitted 75 feet on each lot of boathouse width. That's 150 feet. You'll note the boathouse on the retained lot will be 113 and a half, and we're proposing a restriction to 37. So it's ultimately what would be permitted. That's hence staff's recommendation. I would also note, even though only two lots are proposed, I think the property is large enough to likely contemplate three lots based on its extensive uh, frontage and acreage. I think it has nearly uh, a thousand feet of frontage. So 
uh, staff feels comfortable restricting the severed lot to a small boat house to compensate for what would be permitted if it was otherwise vacant. Uh, however, committee uh, can discuss as a condition of consent requiring the removal of the boathouse, but I would look to the applicant's agent as to their um, appetite for such a restriction. They seem comfortable with limiting what they can build in the future. So I hope that uh, helps Councillor Kent uh, understand the proposal. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? I've read the resolution. All those in favor? And anyone opposed? Okay, that's carried. Thank you very much for your time. There's another resolution. Right. There's another resolution. Okay, and another resolution. Let's go by Councillor Kent, second by Councillor Roberts. Be it resolved that zoning bylaw amendment application said BA 0423 bylaw one, sorry, 2023 016 Hall be approved, subject following minor amendments to permit a cumulative single story boathouse width of 113.5 feet on the retained lot to replace. Replace Schedule 2 on Bylaw 2023-016 with an updated zoning sketch. And three, restrict the, the maximum permitted cumulative lot width on the severed lot to be 50 feet and restrict the math, maximum permitted cumulative single-story boathouse width on the severed lot to 37 feet. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Anyone opposed? Just hold your hands because she's oh. got to be able to move the screen to capture the side of the room. Okay. Thanks. Okay. That's carried. Okay. The next application is it be a 5822 Miller, and that is Ms. Walker again. Thank you very much, Chair Edwards. The next application to be heard is zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 58 slash 22 bylaw 2022 193 in the name of Anthony Miller and Karen Miller Trust. The subject property does not have a civically assigned address. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan and drawings beginning on page 76 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of this application is summarized as follows. <clears throat> Excuse me. In 1999, council approved zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA-49-99 bylaw 1999-97 to restrict land-based buildings and structures to a specified building slash development envelope and to mit limit maximum floor area of a future dwelling to 2,152 square feet. The purpose of the current bylaw, bylaw 2022-193, is to repeal section one, subsection I of bylaw 1999-97, which delineates the approved building envelopes and restricts a dwelling to 2,152 square feet. Bylaw 2022-193 will restrict land-based buildings and structures to a new building envelope identified through our recent engineering report. Bylaw 2022-193 will also rezone the subject lands from Waterfront Residential WR5-7 to Waterfront Residential Holding WR5-7H. The holding zone would restrict the construction of any buildings or structures, excluding a septic system, until a scoped environmental impacts assessment is completed and a wildland fire risk assessment. Notice of this public meeting under the Planning Act was circulated 21 days in advance and eight submissions have been received to date. The comments are summarized as follows. Comments have been received from Nick Snyder, the township's chief building official, Curtis Savrette, planner for the District of Muskoka, Douglas Holland, the township's fire prevention officer, Tim Sopko, the township's public works technician, and the Trillium Lakelands District School Board. Letters of objection have been received from the following. Dave Armstrong, an area property owner, Raymond Stein and Nancy Viner, area property owners, 
Dee Fawner from Northern Vision Planning on behalf of Leslie White and Ed Cass, neighboring property owners to the east. These submissions were circulated to committee prior to today's meeting, but I'm happy to read any submissions in full at the request of committee. I've prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration. Staff have recommended that zoning bylaw amendment applications at BA-5822 bylaw 2022 193, the Anthony Miller Trust and the Kara Miller Trust be approved. It's the understanding of staff that the applicant wishes to defer the application to complete the necessary studies. Staff would have no concerns with this approach. I have no further comments, but I'm happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Sorry, do we have the owner or agent who would like to come in, please? Mr. Allen. Thank you, Chair Edwards. Good morning. Uh, my name is Ryan Allen. I'm a professional planner with Planscape, Bracebridge, Ontario, 104 Kimberly Ave, P1L1Z8. And I'm here today assisting Karen and Anthony Miller with their vacant lot on uh, Lake Rosso. Um, if we could queue up my presentation, please. And if we could jump right to uh, page number six. The subject property has more than 300 feet of frontage and 1.5 acres of lot area and complies uh, fully with the requirements of the zoning bylaw area and frontage. Um, thanks, Ms. Walker, for your detailed explanation of the amendment and some of the proposed history. I'll add a little bit more. The subject lot was created as part of multiple severance applications back in 1998 to adjust lot lines and establish new right-of-ways. In 1998, the building inspector raised concerns related to the size, depth, and steepness of the severed lot, which is the subject lot of this application from a septic servicing perspective. The building inspector required an engineering report as a condition of severance approval to review the servicing capacity of the lot. Subsequently, Stantec Consulting completed an engineering review in 1999 that determined a building envelope septic system location and maximum servicing capacity of 2,500 liters per day for a four bedroom dwelling with 25 fixture units. And bylaw 1999-97 implemented this engineering review and specifically identified um, the building envelope and a maximum floor area for a dwelling of 2,152 square feet. Uh, fast forward 24 years, um, uh, the Millers have engaged Granite Engineering Services to complete a property assessment report uh, for the subject lands to determine uh, potential building location sites beyond the minimum 66-foot shoreline setback, to review a septic system designed uh, by Taylor Farms, looking at the layout location and size of the dwelling. Uh, the report from Granite Engineering um, confirmed one uh, building envelope, which is the same building envelope that is identified by uh, Stantec. So the bylaw on your page 1999-97, that's the building envelope identified by Stantec. And the building envelope A is the same building envelope uh, identified by Granite Engineering. Granite Engineering also identified a second building envelope, building envelope B, it's to the east of the, um, the, the septic system, and the septic system is shown to be in the same location on both plans. Um, Granite Engineering also confirmed a daily septic system capacity of 5,000 liters per day, which would allow for a 5,000 square foot dwelling with four bedrooms and 29 fixture units. Next slide, please. The township has issued a septic permit for a system uh, with a daily design capacity of 5,000 liters per day on the subject property. And I believe the issuance of this permit confirms that there is a servicing capacity that is double the capacity that was determined in 1999. Next slide, please. This is a photo of uh, building envelope B, and you'll see that the, the lands are relatively level and there are no uh, steep slopes. Uh, which is consistent with the granite engineering report next slide please in terms of planning analysis the reason for limiting the maximum floor area to a dwelling in 1999 to 2152 square feet was specifically due to a daily design capacity septic system limit of 2500 liters per day uh, this was not a requirement um, that was imposed by council or the committee of adjustment or the request of neighboring landowners. This was done at the request of the building inspector. 
And a building permit has now been issued by the township for 5,000 liter per day system. So on that basis, I don't believe there is a need to maintain the 2,152 square foot maximum dwelling limit. I note that the Development Services Department, through their comments related to this application, have also raised more concerns. Uh, Granite Engineering has identified two acceptable building envelopes within the minimum setbacks. And thank you, Ms. Walker, for uh, highlighting the fact that we would be requesting a deferral of this application today to complete the wildland fire risk assessment and the deer habitat, um, deer wintering habitat assessment uh, to avoid having to come back another day to lift the hold. We found out that Riverstone Environmental has some availability to complete that work uh, in the coming month. So we would expect to return with that completed, with those completed studies uh, for a decision at that time. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you very much, Mr. Allen. Uh, I will ask, is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support of this application? Is there anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Can you bring them in, please? Yes, Mr. Yep. Fawner, you may go ahead. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Steve Fawner, uh, Northern Vision Planning Limited, 109 Meadow Heights Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. Sorry about the delay when you get, get changed over to a panelist. Uh, you don't know what's said. So anyways, I'm here representing uh, Leslie uh, White, and I see that she's on as well. And uh, her husband, Ed Cass, they own property immediately to the east. And I have submitted uh, a letter of objection, and I, I won't go through it all, but I'll, I'll highlight it, and some members maybe didn't get a chance to, uh, to read it. Um, anyways, with the uh, old bylaw in place, uh, the 1999 bylaw, and, and my clients purchased their property in 2012, they were very cognizant of that bylaw. And basically what it does is it actually gives a side yard setback, uh, fortunately for my clients, of about 150 feet from the east lot line. So... Um, they felt that their privacy was assured on, on that side of the property. And of course, now we have uh, something different. And I fully recognize that there are changes in, um, you know, technologies and that type of thing with the uh, sewage system. So uh, things can uh, change. Um, I would uh, note that, uh, you know, that old bylaw was based on the servicing and the uh, train, which, and of course, the train hasn't, hasn't changed. But uh, um, anyways, um, I would note one of the questions I had was, you know, sort of the contour information, the old contour uh, map, if you will, which was with the old bylaw, you'll see a couple of labels where building envelope B is. And one says top of bank, and one says bottom of bank, and they're pretty close together. So there, there must be a, an area in there that's extremely steep. And it looks like that, in my opinion, would be within building envelope B, probably at the north extent of it. Um, and it looks like there may be some level area as well, but I, I just don't find it totally clear with the information that we have in front of us. In terms of um, moving forward, and we certainly note that uh, deferral is being requested, and I'm, I'm quite pleased that uh, uh, committee is carrying on with the public meeting because I think you should get all input as well. Certainly, my client's first choice would be, of course, not to approve the bylaw at all and, and look at uh, and re retain what's there in the, in the old bylaw. But with that said, again, recognizing new technologies, we know things change. However, we think that there's some options that uh, committee should consider. Uh, one of them is um, whether there should be deferral, but asking for additional information. Uh, that would be clarifying the contour information uh, would be one thing. Um, the other is, um, you know, there's no site specific uh, proposal for this property, so it is difficult to determine potential impacts. We understand that with the septic permit that's been issued, that that's been issued for a dwelling and a sleeping cabin in the boathouse. So we're not sure that uh, building envelope B is needed. Um, so there could be deferral for some additional information. Um, potentially, I know it's not normally done, whether a peer review should be done with the engineering report, but I know Sandy Boss is very capable, but uh, that's something else to uh, consider. Um, we would also suggest, too, that, again, depending on committee's comfort level, 
if there's to be construction in uh, uh, building envelope B at all, that it should be a non-habitable building and it should have an enhanced setback. And I think given the fact that there's been a septic permit approved for a dwelling, which would be in the west building envelope, and a sleeping cabin and a boathouse, I, I don't think that that would be a major impediment at all to restrict, make restrictions regarding building envelope B or not approve it at all. But uh, anyways, those are, uh, those are my submissions. And uh, certainly uh, I would like to receive notice of any uh, further meetings regarding this application. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fawner. And is there anyone else who'd like to, to make comment? No, no one else? Okay. Uh, we have had a uh, request for this to be adjourned. Oh, excuse me. Uh, uh, Ms. White uh, would like to make a submission. My apologies for interjecting. Okay, sorry. Oh, okay, I'm sorry in that, Ms. White. Uh, thank you. I won't take too much time because I think Stevens actually covered a lot of what we think might be a compromise for this. I just wanted to give a bit of color on why we're objecting to this bylaw. Um, you know, I've been a Muskoka resident for just shy of 60 years. My family bought into Muskoka in the mid 1970s up in Lowerson Bay, uh, right next to what would have been uh, at that time known as the Bible Camp and is now known as Muskoka Woods Resort. So I've, I've certainly understand development and progress and everything that's happened on the lake. Um, when we purchased in 2012, we did do a tremendous amount of research on what the development and the future development would be. And we were very comfortable with the bylaw that was associated with this adjacent lot. So now that we're facing this um, full development of the lot, um, quite frankly, my husband and I are, are quite devastated. We're hoping that through the actual uh, process, we might be able to come to some uh, compromise that allows us to continue to enjoy the the uh, the privacy of our our um, pro of our property. And I will note that with the 15 foot side back on on building um, B, which is our primary concern, um, it's my view that that if this was a a, a livable structure, they'd be looking right into our living room and we'd be looking right at it. While the planning um, reports say that it's well treated, it's not well treated between where our property is and where the sideline is. Um, there is a lot of, of view there. And we find that that's going to be very um, disruptive to our enjoyment of the property. Um, that's, our, that's our biggest concern. And um, I would just add that um, I know that real estate is not the purview of this planning committee, but to demonstrate how much we are very um, concerned about this over the last three to five years, we have offered to purchase this vacant lot with the sole communication to the current owner that it would be to maintain the continued buffer between the properties, which has been enjoyed for the last decades. Um, that just is a demonstration of how much we um, are, are committed to the privacy of the product. So I, I just want to, to add that I hope that we can um, take a look very seriously at building B and make some amendments around there to, to improve the overall um, uh, purpose of this for our property. Thanks for your comments. Thank you very much. Uh, their agent has asked for a uh, deferral, and I think this is what we should do. And maybe, uh, Mr. Allen, you could reach out to the Whites, and then maybe you could uh, and that talk to them and see what you can do. Uh, okay. I have Mr. Allen, and would you like to, to speak first? Uh, yes, uh, thank you um, through, through you, Mr. Chair. I, I did have a chance to review Mr. Fawner's submission and li listen closely uh, to, to the verbal comments. Uh, when you visit the site, uh, building envelope A clearly is the preferred location for a dwelling. So I think that we can um, go back and discuss with the Millers about what type of restrictions can be imposed in building envelope B, and we might be able to satisfy all parties here. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharp. You wanted to say something? 
Thank you, Chair Edwards. I just wanted to remind committee when we're deferring an application, it's uh, very helpful to planning staff to know exactly what it is that we're deferring for. And I've heard from Mr. Allen initially that the deferral was to complete some studies. It sounds like he's uh, uh, willing to, to work with Mr. Fawner. But just again, just a, a note to committee um, when we're deferring, um, if there's anything else that you would like looked at, uh, we certainly note that uh, as part of this process. And that way when it returns, um, hopefully we can um, gain everybody's support and bring this forward to council. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharp. Uh, yes, I have uh, Councillor Roberts, then Councillor Kent. Hey, thank you, Chair, and through you. Yes, I'm very encouraged with the, the offer um, or suggestion that the two parties could get together and perhaps come up with a, a compromise or a, 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 a solution that would be uh, in the best interests of both. So uh, I'm supportive of that, uh, that that happen before it comes back or at least attempted to, to be resolved before it comes back to uh, committee. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Roberts. Councillor Kent. Thank you, and uh, through you, I um, just want to clarify one thing. I if if building lot the building lot A is the preferred building spot, and you build a house that's bigger than the one that was originally there, two thousand one hundred thirty-five. Let's say you build. Would you even be able? You wouldn't be able to build building lot B. This is just a clarification for me. Apart from it being a sleeping cabin, am I right, or is that a? You're not allowed to have two cottages on one property. So could somebody in our planning group please clarify for me um, what would be allowed if you built a um, more significant house on a uh, cottage on, on A, what would be allowed on B? Okay. For you, Chair Edwards, um, you're correct. Councillor Kent, you wouldn't be permitted a second dwelling on this property. You would be permitted a sleeping cabin or another type of land-based accessory structure such as a garage or a shed on that second lobby or billing area. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, we can. Yeah, just, just to follow up, if you don't mind, uh, Chair. And how big, in order, how big can the cottage on building lot A be? within the size of the building lot in terms of square footage, assuming we can get the septic system sorted out. For you, Chair Edwards, um, the dwelling or future dwelling on the property would be limited by lot coverage setbacks, um, what could be serviced by the septic system that's been approved, but there wouldn't be a set number for how large that dwelling could be. It couldn't exceed 7,500 square feet. Um, that's the maximum in our township, but again, lot coverage would also limit the size of that dwelling. Thank you. Are there any more questions? No. Well, it was the uh, deferral was asked for. I think we will defer this one and go on to the next one. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Thank you committee. Have a great day. Resolutions for that effect. Are you okay with that one, Dave? Oh, okay. Okay. Thank you can read that. Moved by Councillor Kent, second by Councillor Mazin. Be it resolved that the resolution to be postponed in order to, for the applicant to complete a scope environmental impact study and to address wildland fire risk and deer habitat. All those in favor. Did you read the first resolution, please? No, I didn't read oh, the first resolution. I'm sorry, I thought you did. No, yep. because normally. You should well, read it before you discuss it. I'm sorry, I just said. I Sorry. Moved by Councilor Nishikawa, second by Councilor Mazin. Be it resolved that zoning bylaw amendment application said BA5822 bylaw 22193, the Anthony Miller Trust and Karen Miller Trust be approved. And we are referring this. So and then, yeah. now we will read the second one. Oh, can't read it for the. Sorry. Okay, moved by Councillor Kent, second by Councillor Madden. Be it resolved that the resolution be postponed in order for the, that the applicant complete a scope environmental impact study to address wildland fire risk and deer habitat. Okay, thank you. All Sorry. those in favor. 
Okay, that is carried. Thank you. Yeah, so I will count that out. And the okay, yeah, so that one goes. Yes, Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. I know the vote's been, been held already, but wasn't there something about uh, the age? Maybe it's not necessary. It's it's uh, that the agents would get together with the neighbor to uh, look for a compromise. Does that not um, need to be? Well, that doesn't have to be in it. I don't, I don't okay. believe they can reach out to them and that uh, they, they know what the, the problem is. Thank okay. you. Next application is ZBA 6122 car, and that is Ms. Crowder. Thank you, Chair Edwards. The next application to be heard is ZBA 6122 in the name of car. The subject property has frontage on both Lake Rosso and Silver Lake and is located at 3164 Muskoka Road 118 West, Unit 21A. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan on page 128 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is to recognize the existing lot frontage and configuration of the subject land through an exemption from site-specific bylaw 2019-164. Bylaw 2019-164 was passed at the time of a previous severance, and it established a minimum lot frontage and lot area of 350 feet and 60 acres. However, after the severance was finalized, a survey revealed that the property actually has a frontage of 336 feet. The zoning bylaw amendment application is largely a technical planning exercise to recognize the existing lot frontage and area. Notice of this public meeting was circulated 21 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act, and four submissions have been received to date. The District of Muskoka, Trillium Lakeland District School Board, the Township's Public Works Department, and the Development Ser Services Division have all advised that they have no objections to the application. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and have recommended that the bylaw be approved. I have no further comments at this time and would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I believe the agent is here or the owner, which for the agent first. Good morning. Good morning and good morning committee. Uh, Terry Ledger, agent for the applicant, 167 Medora Street, Fort Carling, P0B1J0. And as uh, Ms. Crowder noted, this is largely technical. It uh, came up in a recent severance to the property uh, that just changed lot area, not frontage. And I think the frontage was the important part is it still uh, is over 60 acres. So that uh, part of the, the bylaw is fine. So it's really just to recognize the actual frontage that was um, determined after a, a proper survey was done. And I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else wishing to speak in support of this application? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Are there questions from the members? No? <clears throat> Moved by Councillor Burry, second by Mayor Kelly, be it resolved that zoning by law amendment application said B8 6122. Bylaw 2022 208 car be approved. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? That is carried. Thank you. Okay. And the next one is. Uh, ZBA 5922 Kennedy, and that is Ms. Crowder. I'm going to turn off my screen, Chair. Thank you, Chair Edwards. The next application to be heard is ZBA 5922 in the name of Kennedy. 
The subject property is known municipally as 1893 Bear Cave Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan on page 159 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is to rezone the part, a part of the subject lands to permit a tourist resort consisting of a maximum of five accommodation units, each with a maximum floor area of 323 square feet. The application also seeks to rezone a part of the subject lands to environmental protection over a wetland feature as seen on page 163 of the agenda package. Notice of this public meeting was circulated 22 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act and five submissions have been received to date. The Township's Public Works Department and the Trillium Lakeland District School Board both state no objections to the application. The Township's Development Services Division provided comments stating that buildings intended to be used as seasonal recreational buildings, as indicated in this application, are exempt from requirements for plumbing, heating, mechanical ventilation, among a number of other things. This is true for seasonal tourist accommodations for rent. However, where the, any of these services are provided, they must comply with the requirements of the Ontario Building Code. Comments from the Township's Emergency Services Department provide details regarding response time in the event of a fire and recommend additional design features beyond the minimum requirements in lieu of the fact that the property is outside the rural response time objective. Comments have been received from the District Municipality of Muskoka, stating that provided Township Council are satisfied that the provision of appropriate water and septic services, emergency access, and the disposal of solid waste can be addressed to support the proposed use, district staff would not be opposed to the approval of the application. And when the application was submitted, the applicant attached five letters of support from area neighbors. These comments were submitted prior to the circulation of the notice of public meeting. These neighbors are Roy West, Linda Forth, Marcy Vine and Mark Vader, Fred and Alfredo Esteved, and Valerie Iankovic and Alistair Bates. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and have recommended that the bylaw be approved subject to the following. Sorry, subject to the following minor amendments to bylaw 2022-195. To require the establishment of an accessory dwelling unit and office prior to the issuance of a building permit for an accommodation unit. Remove the restriction of proposed accommodation unit and accessory dwelling unit to be replaced with a general development envelope. And restrict the permitted uses in the RUC2 zone to exclude golf course, hotel, and motel. And approval of a bylaw subjecting the intended development of the subject land to the township's site plan control process. I have no further comments at this time and would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Crowder. And I believe we have the agent and the owner here. Uh, thank you very much. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of planning committee and staff, and also any members watching the meeting uh, today. Uh, my name is Patrick Towns. I'm a land use planner with MHBC in our Barrie office. We're located at 113 Collier Street, Barrie, Ontario, L4M. 1H2. Um, I understand uh, staff is going to share my presentation, so I appreciate whoever is uh, working the slides for me today. But uh, just to continue with an introduction, uh, we did complete a uh, due diligence for the owner. Um, just one sec here. Sorry, my sh oh my screen shifted, so I'm just putting you back at the forefront here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so following completion of the due diligence review uh, we did for this development, we were retained by the owner, Jared Kennedy, to submit this application on his behalf. Uh, Mr. As mentioned, Mr. Kennedy's participating today. And just a, a brief history for planning committee, the owner was renting out cabins on the subject property uh, prior to being informed that the, the use was not permitted in accordance with the township zoning bylaw. So therefore leading to the proposed application to permit the use of a site specific uh, limited tourist resort uh, use on the subject property. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. 
So as mentioned, the zoning bylaw amendment is required to permit a tourist uh, uh, resort use on the subject property. Although the proposed use meets the definition of a tourist resort use in the zoning bylaw, the application is framed in a manner to consider a site-specific zoning for the rural commercial resort zone, and that's to limit the intensity and scale of the use itself. So those limitations include proposing a maximum of five small rental cabins, which are referred to as uh, accommodation units in the report and the bylaw, and an associated maximum size with those uh, small rental cabins. The application also proposes to recognize and protect a wetland feature on the south portion of the property. Uh, this feature is actually not protected under the current zoning bylaw and therefore EP zoning will be implemented to protect it. Next slide, please. Just to set a, a context of location where the subject property is located towards the north end of the township, uh, somewhat uniquely uh, located in proximity to Georgian Bay to the west, the Seguin, Seguin boundaries to the north, and then Huntsville to the east. Next slide, please. Uh, on this slide, the subject property is outlined in red. Uh, the property has frontage on Bear Cave Road uh, to the north and then borders a section of the Shadow River to the south. Uh, the subject property, the lot area is approximately 11 acres and it has approximately 330 feet of frontage on Bear Cave Road. As evident from the aerial photo, uh, the subject property is uh, well vegetated containing mature tree cover. Next slide. I included this slide just to show area context of the surrounding lot fabric and configuration. Uh, similar to the subject property, the surrounding properties are well vegetated and development is well separated from each other. A fairly representative situation of a typical rural development area. So surrounding land uses include rural residential development and uh, that are currently screen and buffer from that, those existing trees. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, a copy of the conceptual site plan drawing for the existing and the proposed development is shown on this slide. Uh, this is a concept plan that was submitted with the application. It shows uh, the locations of the existing buildings and structures on the property as of today, and then shows what buildings are proposed. Uh, this of course includes the five, five uh, cabins and also the proposed accessory dwelling unit that the owner is going to live in so he can overlook the, the rental business uh, itself. It should be also noted that the owner has removed some of the existing buildings and structures, uh, including some of the cabins that were previously rented out on the property, knowing that these would not meet the required building code requirements, so they, they wouldn't be able to le be legalized through this process. And this slide itself, uh, it may show it best, but the green area to the Excuse south you, is you the actual- seconds left. Okay, thank you. Yep. The, uh, the area to the south is the, the wetland that is protected. And just next slide, if we'll go right to the operational considerations. The owners implemented some, some items that, that uh, will be used to control the use in, in terms of limiting the size of the cabins to 323 square feet. This would, uh, it, his business is catered to renting to couples. So it's very low intensity of use. And that's what I just wish to highlight as I get close to the time limit here. Um, but we agree with staff's report. Excuse me, Mr. Towns, you're going to have to wrap it up, please. Yep, thank you. The, uh, we agree with staff's opinion. The, the application conforms to the official plans. It's consistent with the PPS and with the, the zoning restrictions in place. Uh, we, uh, we agree with staff's opinion and uh, we're here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support? Anyone in opposition? Okay, are there uh, questions from uh, the uh, council, the members? I don't see any. Oh, yes. Sorry, Councilor Mazin. Uh, thank you. Just a quick question. I'm going through staff report and I hadn't picked up on this previously and I'm just reviewing it. I do note under the analysis that the proposed development should be made subject to site plan control. How does that, um, how do we implement that with the Bill 23? Mr. Sharp. Thank you, uh, Chair Edwards. Um, in this particular instance, uh, given the rezoning to a commercial zone, um, 
we still have the authority under the Planning Act to uh, impose site plan control. So what we've recommended is a, a bylaw to subject the property and the proposed development to, sub, to site plan control. That bylaw will be passed by council at a later, at a later date. And then um, before a building permit would be available, they would need to um, enter into a site plan agreement with the township. And once that process is complete, uh, a building permit would then um, uh, be available. Thank you. Okay, does that answer? Your question? Yes, thank you. That quite, could I ask a second question? Yes, you may. And while I know it, it doesn't uh, directly correlate to what is being asked of today, is it appropriate to ask for a status update on the bylaw enforcement? Uh, thank you uh, through you, the chair. Um, I think, keep in mind the, the main goal of bylaw enforcement is to achieve compliance. And one of the rights that property owners have is to make application uh, to bring uh, development or use into compliance. And hence, uh, suspect uh, bylaw enforcement staff are watching this process intently. And if the uh, rezoning is approved, um, property would be brought or that uh, use that's proposed or ongoing would be brought into compliance. But I do believe um, you know, the owner, the, the current use should cease. I'd have to follow up with uh, bylaw enforcement staff to um, investigate that angle. But uh, they do have the right to make this application, and uh, we'll see uh, what committee and council decides. Can I ask one? Yes. Sorry, a third question. Uh, I did note in the report that you're, well, this is an unusual. Um, uh, application for a rural setting to have this type of that there is uh, you're noting an increase in this kind of request is that correct would this be a new trend I guess what I'm asking uh, through the chair um, I, I think we noted or staff noted it's unusual in the sense that uh, you know those uh, returning counselors probably can't recall a similar type of application a you know rural resort in my almost 20 years here. I think this is the second time one's been proposed. Um, so it's not common in uh, that regard. And as much as staff supportive of this, I think we'd prefer, um, you know, we might have some concern if it uh, did increase in prevalence. I think, you know, given the sharing economy and the prevalence of, um, you know, websites such as Airbnb and VRBO, I think there's more potential for this in the township. There's a lot of large rural land holdings where, um, you know, tourists or vacationing public may be desirous of that kind of setting or atmosphere. Um, but I think one of the benefits uh, in our new official plan is to require an official plan amendment for a new resort, even in the rural area right now, it's just in the waterfront. And I think that process sh should, be, uh, you know, assist the municipality in ensuring that uh, they're appropriately located. Um, and uh, again, essentially appropriately planned uh, if we do see an increasing trend. I think in my experience, we do get, uh, you know, certain increase at certain times of the year. Um, you know, a lot of people come in the spring with ideas of coffee shops and things in Port Carling and, uh, and these types of resorts, I've heard the odd inquiry, to be honest, most don't pan out, uh, but we do have an application in front of us, which doesn't happen too often. So staff will continue to monitor and uh, if anything's needed, we'll report back. Thank you. Okay. Uh, we'll go to uh, Councillor Kent. Thank you. Um... Just a quick question. Um, am I a, these cabins have no running water and they have outhouses. I just, I, I'm confused. How are people going to actually habitate these places? It's not a campsite. Um, how are they, were they going to have to leave Bear Cave Road and drive to get food and bring their own water in? Or have I, have I missed that somewhere in the application? Uh, thank you. Who can answer that? Thank you. Through you, um, Chair Edwards, I think we would uh, look to maybe the agent to provide a bit more information on um, on what is and is not to be provided. Um, but we would note that um, Building Services did provide comments saying that uh, water services are not uh, required through a seasonal um, resort use. Okay, thank you very much. 
And uh, I see Mr. Kennedy is on the screen. Would you like to say something, sir? Yes, hi. Thank you, uh, everybody. Um, appreciate the time to talk. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, you know, I've, I've owned this property since 2019. I, you know, became really good friends with a lot of the neighbors on the road. And, um, you know, it's, it, the road is rich in history with a lot of, you know, interesting, um, you know, different types of industries. And this is just something that's new. And, you know, as, as they talked a little bit, a little bit about uh, like just how, you know, camping and the dry kind of camping, which is more off grid type seasonal is becoming more popular with the, you know, some of the online websites and stuff like that. And um, yeah, I just, I just really hope that, uh, you know, everyone can see kind of the need for this in the future. And um, it seems to not, be, not only be popular with um, the young people, but, you know, every type of age and demographic and, because I am kind of leaning more toward the couple scenario, it's more of a very calming and um, you know tranquil experience more so than you know your typical resort party type um, spot. So, um, but yeah, I just hope that uh, everybody can kind of see the the future of camping and not having to have the luxurious you know beautiful showers and all that type of stuff. More of just a a weekend getaway with. Uh, just you know more relaxing over you know the um the, the luxurious life so anyways i think patrick will talk a little bit more about the uh the water situation and all that okay uh, thank you just and, very briefly uh, mr chair if i could just that's correct uh, the, the water sewer servicing will comply to the ontario building code and that's based of course on the seasonal seasonal nature of the use Yes, Councillor Kent. Sorry, I'm still confused. So these buildings will have no water access at all and no intention to have water access put in there at a later date. And the washrooms will all be outhouses. I have no problem with that. I'm just trying to clarify that these buildings, apart from maybe the larger building, which is intended for the owner, um, are completely dry, basically tent platforms, uh, as I see them. Maybe there's a bed in there, but there, there is no access to any cooking facilities, water facilities. I don't understand how it can be called a resort. There's no ability to, you have to drive off premise to get food and you'll have to, you can't cook on site. Um, I'm just trying to clarify if that's the case. Thank you. Uh, if I may, yes. thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, it's meant to be off the grid cooking it could be on the fire, but uh, patrons would bring their own water and you're right, the, there'd be a composting toilet or an outhouse, whatever meets the building code at that time. But as Jared mentioned, uh, it mentioned to, it's meant to be off grid living and uh, small scale operation. I think that's the, the point that we wanted to highlight that it is a small scale commercial use and not typical of the, the standard commercial resort. Uh, and the zoning restrictions in place will keep it as that. But yeah, just private, the servicing will be no water to the cabins uh, and then composting toilets. And again, uh, prior to any building permits for those cabins, they'll, they're required to meet the Ontario building code. Yes, supplemental, just, just one sec. Oh, oh, hang on just, just one second. Sorry, just to follow up, if I may. Yep. Yeah. Is does that mean that there's going to be fire pits for each house? Are they going to be allowed to use gas cooking stoves inside the house? I'm just concerned about, you know, in a, in a campsite, things are set up in such a way where there's lots of extra space, there's safety from a fire hazard standpoint. I'm just asking some very basic questions about whether or not how, how they will be cooking meals. And um, I, get, I get it. I've been to plenty of campgrounds. Um, thank you. Mr. Shrepp, you want to comment? Thank you, Chair Edwards. I can't speak specifically to uh, the notion of, of fire pits for each individual cabin. I would leave that to uh, Mr. Towns or Mr. Kennedy to, to speak to, but I would just note, uh, as indicated in our staff report, um, the notion of these units being uh, serviced by, you know, um, uh, outhouses or composting toilets. Um, that is allowed under the Ontario Building Code. We have confirmed that with our chief building official, and it's largely 
completely based on the seasonality of the use. And as part of the site plan agreement uh, process, what we can do is we can include a provision in the agreement where the owner acknowledges that the servicing is based on the seasonal use and wherein the owner agrees um, if that use is ever to change to a, uh, a full-time occupancy, then they would be obligated under the Ontario Building Code to install appropriate um, sewage and uh, uh, water systems. So I just thought that I would note that that, that um, option is available to us through the, uh, the site plan control process. Thank yeah, you. my question, my excuse me, my question was not really related to the toilets and the composting toilets, which I have no problem with. It was really just the how do you how do you cook and not have it be a fire hazard if it hasn't been set up properly? Just the mechanics. I'm sorry to ask another question. Thank you. Uh, I don't think that's really part of this application. Uh, yes, Councillor uh, Nishikawa. And I'm sorry, um, Chair. Are we at comments yet? No, we aren't. At, at Thank you. There, it, it was sort of a, a roundabout question. Okay. <laughs> well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read the resolution and then we will go to questions and comments. Moved by Mayor Kelly, second by Councillor Zabitz, be it resolved that zoning bylaw amendment application said be a 5922 bylaw. 2022. Just a minute, Councillor Zavitz is moved. Oh, he's not on the screen. Apologies. Mm. Right. Change that to move by Mayor Kelly. Check on my uh, Councillor Zavitz. Be it resulted application bylaw amendment application ZBA 5922 bylaw. 2022-195 Kennedy be approved subject to the following. Approval of minor amendments to bylaw 2022-129-2 require the establishment of an accessory dwelling and office prior to the issuance of a building permit for the accommodation unit. To permit the restriction of the location of proposed accommodation units and accessory dwelling unit to be replaced with general development envelopes and three, restrict the permitted use to an RUC2 zone to exclude golf course, hotel, motel, and approval by the of the bylaw subject to the attendant development of the subject plan, the township site plan control process. Any questions or comments at this time? Yes, Councilor Nishkawa. Thank you. I like this application. I like the fact that we will we now know it exists. Um, it's interesting because um, over I, I felt this for a number of years that we are eliminating people from visiting our township any longer. Um, we, it's become a, a fact that you know you're, you're looking at two and three hundred dollars a night just to visit the area uh, without. So I really like this idea. It's interesting some of the comments that came forward, um, and I and I I'm noted that we just set up campsites in the Torrance Barrens with fire pits and all of these other amenities. In fact, no amenities, but but people have the ability to be there for a week or two at a time. Um, so I just find it very interesting. I, I like this concept. I I hope. That we do start to see some of these applications coming forward. I will know. Um, I know that uh, I've been approached over the years to actually um, have people camping on my own property because I'm across from Hardy Lake Park and there's nowhere for people to stay. Um, so I, I really like this idea. I like the fact that that they're going to be registered with the township and. Um, I don't have any concerns uh, um, unless we get complaints. I don't have concerns. I like also the idea of this being up in the, in this particular area. I, I I know that we should be looking forward to growth, uh, you know, up off of 141. I've said this for quite some time and um, also part of the recreation plan. I've, I've brought this up as well. So I'm, I'm going to approve this. Pop. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question or comment? Yes, go ahead. 
Just a quick comment. I support uh, this application as well. I do like the idea of some interesting new uses and thus my question about the, uh, is this a, a new trend that we're seeing? So uh, I too would support this. Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, Councillor Kent. I just want to clarify, I support the application too. I was just referring to the question related to fire hazard. Okay. okay. And you have, I envisioned wood structures with no fire pits in front and or, and then a gas stove that somebody brings inside, inside the house. That makes me very nervous. And I would think that that, on the last application, we were looking at all the fire restrictions and issues. And I would suggest that that should be a concern that we just make sure that the the cooking in a campsite is either done outside or in an acceptable place, because otherwise you're setting up a massive fire hazard. In my personal opinion, I've done a lot of camping. Inside cooking in a wood cabin is not a great idea. Anyway, I support the application. I think it's great. I'm just uh, concerned about the the dangers involved with that. I wasn't concerned about the toilets. Okay. I Normally, yep. I would not do this, but I will let uh, the uh, applicant respond oh i'm i'm sorry um i just absolutely 100 nobody will ever be cooking anything inside it would be 100 percent on an outdoor barbecue so sorry <laughs> we're definitely no no gas anywhere near any buildings <laughs> thank you okay thank you okay i have read the motion there's no other questions or comments all those in favor and that is carried oh, oh switch it Okay, thanks. I'm sure. It's fine. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Okay. And the next application is ZVA 6322 EMJ Escoka Holdings. And that is Ms. Fowler again. Thank you, Chair Edwards. The next application to be heard is ZBA 6322 in the name of EMJ Muskoka Holdings Incorporated. The subject property has frontage on Lake Muskoka and is located at 1185 Marina Road. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plans and drawings starting on page 178 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is to facilitate the construction of a proposed two-story garage with a sleeping cabin in the second story by rezoning the open space private OS2 portion of the property to Waterfront Residential WR1. Notice of this public meeting was circulated 21 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act and seven submissions have been received to date. The District of Muskoka, the Trillium Lakelands District School Board, the Township's Public Works Department, and the Development Services Division have advised that they have no objections. The, the Development Services Division has also advised that the adequacy of the existing sewage system to support the proposed development will be reviewed and confirmed through the building permit application process. Comments from the Township's Emergency Services Department provide details regarding response time in the event of a fire, and recommend additional design features beyond the minimum requirements in lieu of the fact that the property is outside the rural response time objective. The, fo the following circulation of comments to committee were received. A letter um, from Brian, oh sorry, the following circulation of comments to committee, um, the following comments were received. A letter was received from Brian Silver, area property owner, stating no objection to the application and a letter was received from Peter W.R. Lemon, an immediate abutting neighbor to the West, stating that they have no objection to the application. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and have recommended that the bylaw be approved. I have no further comments at this time and would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Crowder. And I see Mr. Fawner is here, so uh, you're welcome to go ahead, sir. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Chair Edwards. Um, Stephen Fawner, uh, Northern Vision Planning Limited, 109 Meadow Heights Drive, Bracebridge, Ontario, P1L1A4. I'm here representing uh, both uh, EMJ Muskoka Holdings and HJM Muskoka Holdings, which is your next application. And these are abutting properties uh, beside each other 
One is access from Marina Road and the other is accessed off a private road off of uh, Walker's Point Road. Um, anyways, I'd like to uh, thank uh, staff for their uh, positive report. And I do know that they, uh, they got out on the property when uh, certainly quite a bit of snow. Um, I have photographs uh, from um, last uh, April, which uh, I think will show things uh, maybe a little better. And that, those were the ones that were in my uh, planning justification report. And I think as noted, there were two letters of support. So if uh, Alex could uh, queue up my uh, PowerPoint presentation, that would be great. Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, we go on to, the, on to the next slide, please. So this is for the Westerly property, but a lot of these uh, matters are going to be the same. Really, it's the photographs are a little bit different and, um, and the elevation drawing of the proposed uh, garage sleeping cabin. So I think it was outlined what the proposal is. There's open space OS2 zoning on the rear portion of the property. Um, uh, however, we're looking to rezone that to WR1 so that we can construct a garage uh, sleeping cabin on uh, each property. Next. This is the overall site plan of the uh, property. Again, the westerly lot is accessed off of Marina Road and the easterly lot is actually, there's a, you can see uh, partway up the um, side lot that you can see the access from Walker's Point Road. Next. This is just a zeroing in and you can see it's labeled proposed garage that that would be with the sleeping cabin above. Both these structures are over um, uh, 200 feet uh, back from the high watermark. Next. And this is outlining the uh, zoning on the property, the uh, OS2 and, uh, and the property outlined is both properties. That property fabric and the orange line should actually be shifted a little bit to the west. It's a little bit off. But important to note there, there is a neighbor's garage that actually is in the OS2 zone. And we're going to be about uh, the same setback as that. Next. Excuse me. And this is just a drawing showing the area that we uh, are proposing to rezone. Next. So this is on the uh, westerly lot uh, owned by Gary Greenbaum, and this is the uh, proposed structure uh, as seen from the lake side. You won't be able to see this from the lake because of the setback. Next. And this is the entrance uh, to the property off of uh, Marina Road. Next. And this is uh, just along Marina Road. You can actually see the cottage away through there. In the summertime, there's no way that you'd be able to see through this forest. Next. And this is actually on the laneway in, looking back towards the road, so looking to the south. Next. And this would be the approximate location of the uh, garage. It's uh, uh, going to be uh, a little bit over the uh, private road that is air entrance, and that's going to be relocated just slightly to the left on this uh, photo. Next. And this is uh, an existing parking area, which would have been a great area to put the garage, except you can see the overhead hydro lines. So we're unable to locate a structure under those lines. The actual garage will be just off to the left of this photo. Next. And this is the rear of the existing dwelling that is uh, on the property. Next. And this is the uh, view from the uh, dock at that time. Again, uh, time when there's a lack of foliage. So uh, once this is greened up, um, yeah, certainly the dwelling can be seen, but uh, it's not totally open to the lake. Next. So in terms of planning analysis, uh, we don't know the origin of the open space OS2 zone. There was a site specific application Pony, many years. Have, Mr. Pony, have less than 45 seconds, please. Okay. Alrighty. So anyways, um, uh, go on to the next slide, please. Um, so the proposal meets all aspects of the bylaw and the proposed lot coverage is 4.84%. And as noted, it's over 200 feet back from the water. Next. And it won't be seen from the lake and it satisfies the OP criteria. Next. Um, and we've had letters of support. Next. And this is the garage on the neighboring property. Next and another photo of it, and this is in the OS2 zone, next. And support letters I've noted, next. And in conclusion, I don't need to go back through the points, but uh, it does conform, in my opinion, to the district and township official plans and does represent good planning. And I'm here to answer any questions, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Fauner, and thank you for sticking to the five minutes. I much appreciate it. We have a busy agenda. 
Uh, is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support of this application? Anyone wishing to speak in opposition to this application? Are there any questions from the members? No questions? Uh, moved by Councillor Zavitz, second by Councillor Kent. Be it resolved that zoning bylaw amendment application Bed B A 6322 bylaw 2022-212 EMJ Muskoka Holdings Inc. be approved. Any questions or comments? All those in favor. And I think because the other one is almost a, a, a identical, we'll do that, then we'll take a comfort break. And the next application is HJM Muskoka Holdings Inc. And that is Ms. Crowder again. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Edwards. The next application to be heard is ZBA 6422 in the name of HJM Muskoka Holdings Incorporated. The subject property has frontage on Lake Muskoka and is located at 1631 Walkers Point Road, Unit 8. Please note that this property abuts and is located to the east of the property that was the subject of the previous application heard today by committee. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plans and drawings starting on page 237 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is to facilitate the construction of a proposed two-story garage with a sleeping cabin in the second story by rezoning the open space private OS2 portion of the property to waterfront residential WR1. Notice of this public meeting was circulated 21 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act, and six submissions have been received to date. Sorry, correction, seven submissions have been received to date. The District of Muskoka, the Township's Public Works Department, and the Development Services Division have advised that they have no objections. The Development Services Division has also advised that the adequacy of the existing sewage system to support the proposed development will be reviewed and confirmed through the building permit application process. Comments from the Township's Emergency Services Department provide details regarding response time in the event of a fire and recommend additional design features beyond the minimum requirements in lieu of the fact that the property is outside the rural response time objective. A letter was received from Brian Silver, area property owner, stating no objection to the application and a letter was received from Peter W.R. Lemon, an, abutting, sorry, an immediate abutting neighbor to the West, stating that they have no objection to the application. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and have recommended that the bylaw be approved. I have no further comments at this time and would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Crowder. And uh, I believe the agent is here, Mr. Pawner. If there's any other changes, you can just say ditto. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess so. I always uh, like to be thorough, as you know, and I know you do have a busy agenda. I, I can, if if the uh, uh, if you wish, we can uh, queue up the PowerPoint. I'll just go right to the photos. Uh, uh, I'm, you know, actually, uh, I'm at the disposal of committee. Whatever you wish to do. No, you can make your presentation just be uh, and that as thorough and as quick as possible. Thank you. <laughs> I'll be quicker than the last one because I can certainly skip over some things. So go ahead, Alex. Uh, next, uh, next, uh, next, and next. Um, I was going to mention um, in my previous presentation, there was a site-specific application in this uh, area many, many years ago. Same situation with the open space OS2 zone, and, and the origin at that time was, was unknown. So uh, anyways, next. Next. So just wanted to stop here. This is on the easterly lot. So the footprint of this uh, particular building is a little bit bigger, but I have filed floor plans with the uh, planning staff and uh, both of the sleeping cabins are 650 square feet above. Uh, this happens to be a slightly larger uh, footprint uh, for the structure here. Next. And so again, I noted the garage. This is the entrance also from uh, Walker's Point Road. Uh, this is looking east. Next. And this would be the location of the proposed uh, garage. And you'll notice a little bit of grassed area to the right. Next. And that's the uh, part of the uh, septic bed there. So uh, next. 
This is the area in behind the dwelling on the property. And again, you can see the neighbor's garage in the background and the proposed garage will be behind where the uh, truck is. Next. And this is a dwelling on the subject lands. It's actually very, very similar to the one uh, on the property to the west. Next. And the view from the dock uh, into the property. Next. Yeah, so I think we can just uh, carry on. I think and we have letters of support from the neighbors. Um, and uh, in terms of the lot coverage here, it's a little bit less because it is larger. It's 3.76%, even though the proposed structure is a little larger. So those are all my comments and I'm here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Fawner. Is there anyone else here who wishes to speak in support? Anyone in opposition? Okay, other questions from the members? If not, I'll read the resolution. Moved by Councilor Mazin, second by Councilor Burry. Be it resolved that Sony bylaw amendment application set BA 6422 bylaw 2022-213 HJM Muskoka Holdings Inc. be approved. Any questions or comments? All those in favor. Thank you very much. That is carried. And would you like a 10 or 15 minute uh, comfort break? 15? Okay, we'll take a 15 minute break. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day.
Chair Edwards, I don't know if you can hear me, but I cannot hear you. I did not hear any comments um, provided by Ms. Crowder. Hi, Ryan, it's Gord here. I, I did not hear anything either. I hear you, Gord. Okay, good. Good to see you, Ryan. <laughs> Chris, Chris, can you hear us? Uh, now I can, but I couldn't hear the beginning part, but now I can, yeah. Let's take a look. Where, the council, where, where did they go? We're all on Zoom. Well, I'm on Zoom. Uh, Glenn, can you hear us? Yeah, and Sally? Where's Sally? Yeah, so yeah, so we can just have our own little meeting. Everything passed. Let's go. <laughs> Thank you try, Thanks, Councillor Roberts. Well, it was only that easy. <laughs> Not with me on the call. Yeah. <laughs> I'll call okay, we're back. <laughs> can you hear me? We can now. You okay. can now? Okay. I'm going to have uh, Ms. Crowder read everything again, unfortunately. But she does such a good job, she doesn't mind. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll try this again. <laughs> Can you hear that, Gord? Okay. Great. All right, thank you, Chair Edwards. The next application to be heard is ZBA 0223 in the name of Graham. The subject property has frontage on Lake Rosso and is located at 1250 Ferndale Road, Unit 3. I would direct committee's attention to the submitted site plan on page 303 of the agenda package. The purpose and effect of the application is to permit an as-built landing at the foot of a stairway. The zoning bylaw exempts landings with a size of 50 square feet or less from front yard setback requirements. In this case, the landing has an area of 66 square feet and an exemption is therefore requested. An exemption is also requested to permit the landing to be located partly over water. Notice of this public meeting was circulated 20 days in advance of today's meeting in accordance with the Planning Act and five submissions have been received to date. The District of Muskoka, the Trillium Lakelands District School Board, the Township's Public Works Department and the Development Services Division have advised that they have no objections. Philip and Alexandra Norris, owners of the abutting property to the West have submitted comments stating that they are in opposition to the application. This letter has been forwarded to committee members in advance of today's meeting and can be read in full at the request of committee. In summary, the letter states that the as-built structure should be viewed as a dock instead of as a landing and raises concerns about the construction of this structure without the benefit of a building permit. A concern is specifically raised with regard to its encroachment into the 30-foot setback that applies to docks. This letter also states that this structure's location within 17 feet of the common property line is in close proximity to their dining room and boathouse, which adversely affects their enjoyment of their property. Staff have prepared a detailed planning report for committee's consideration and have recommended that the bylaw be approved. I have no further comments at this time and would be happy to answer any questions from committee. Yeah, Thank you. Come on in. Thank you very much, Ms. Crowder. And uh, Mr. Allen, would you like to speak now? Can you, have you heard that? Uh, thank you, Chair Edwards. Yes, loud and clear. Uh, my name is Ryan Allen. I'm a professional planner with Planscape, uh, Bracebridge, Ontario, 104 Kimberly Avenue, uh, P1L1Z8. I'm here today assisting Chris and Amy Graham with their application. The subject lands are located at 1250 unit number three, Ferndale Road. Uh, thanks, Ms. Crowder, for spending the time to introduce this application twice. So I won't go over the details of the proposed amendment. I do have an, a, a presentation that I'd like to share. And if we could jump right to page number three, that would be great. This property was subject to a variance application in 2020, which approved a reconfiguration of the existing docks uh, to allow for the construction of a new boathouse. So in 2019, a survey was completed. Um, you can see the location of the existing docks there. And the site plan for the building permit is immediately below. The same shoreline in 2019 survey was used in the building permit survey. 
and you'll see the uh, the landing uh, was initially contemplated at the time of building permit submission, and it's highlighted in green uh, with an arrow uh, showing the uh, landing on the side of the boathouse towards the rear. I would note that uh, the variance reduced the overall amount of dock width on the property uh, from the from the existing prior to 2020. Next slide, please. This is an elevation of the, the boathouse uh, that was submitted with the building permit plans. So you can see the access door was always intended and envisioned to be uh, towards the rear on the side of the boathouse, accessed by the landing that was shown on the building permit plans. Uh, fast forward uh, to 2022. Next slide, please. The landing was constructed, and at the, the time of finaling the, the boathouse and dock, uh, the building department requested a survey to confirm the as-built landing was entirely located um, over land. This 2022 survey revealed that it wasn't, um, hence the application uh, here today. The landing is 64.6 uh, square feet. As part of the access to the landing, there would be new stairs that would be constructed, and the existing stairs that provided access to a previous dock would be removed. And I would note that there is ample uh, boat parking on this property. There is uh, one existing dock that has a slip, as well as four slips within the existing boathouse. And every one of those uh, boathouse slips is a wet slip. Next slide, please. Prior to construction of the landing, this was the, uh, the boathouse access door. You'll see that there was a temporary access provided by a gangplank. Um, Chris and Amy have some young children and uh, access to that boathouse is uh, unsafe at best. So uh, steps were taken to uh, address that access issue by constructing the landing. Next slide, please. Uh, this is the existing landing as built. You can see the existing stairs that used to provide access to the previous dock that has now been removed. Those stairs would be reconfigured to provide access to the landing itself. Um, the landing was constructed uh, slightly over the 50 square foot size to avoid disruption to this existing mature tree uh, that's labeled on this drawing. You'll also notice that if you uh, if you look at the, the image on the right side, there is uh, some shoreline that is underneath the landing. That part of the landing uh, is, is above the high water mark. However, the area below the door of the boathouse is not. Next slide, please. The terrain behind, immediately behind the existing boathouse is quite intense and it does not provide easy access to simply relocate the, um, the boathouse door to the back side of the boathouse. Heavy equipment and possibly even blasting would be required to excavate the shoreline um, to, uh, to create an area for access. So the, the preferred approach was to use the existing door as built and use an existing location that required no tree removal or site alteration. Next slide, please. Uh, this is a photo of the uh, the property from the pathway that leads down to the dock at Boathouse. The property is significant. Uh, Mr. Allen, you have about 40 seconds left. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Edwards. The property is significantly elevated above the shoreline with the dwelling on the, on the top and the boathouse uh, far below. Next slide, please. In terms of planning analysis, the boathouse door uh, is located over water and is proposed to be accessed by a landing, not a dock. The small size of this landing is not well suited to be used as a dock or sun deck. Shallow water depths will prevent the use of this landing as a dock, and I mentioned ample boat parking exists across the lot. The initial building permit plans included the dock and, um, uh, excuse me, the landing next to the existing dock and boathouse. The bylaw allows a 50 square foot landing as close as a zero foot uh -huh. Sure Mr. Way. Allen, your time is up. Can you please just one last sentence? Thank you. I would suggest that the existing landing has the least impact to the shoreline vegetation and the existing topography and is the preferred access to the boathouse. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support of this application? Anyone in opposition? Okay. Could you bring them in, please? Yes, sir. Would you like to speak? Yes. So I am turning on my camera. Hi, I'm Philip Norris. Hi, I'm the neighbor to the west at 1250 Ferndale Road, unit number uh, three. 
no, two, <laughs> we're unit two, sorry. Uh, P zero, B one, J zero. So uh, in the application for this boathouse, it was stated that the reason they were allowed to have the, um, the variance to have the, the boathouse built was that they would be clearing out the 30 foot setback. As you can see, uh, am I allowed to share a picture? Yes. No, uh, no, oh, no, you can't. Sorry. Oh, no. Okay. <laughs> so uh, we have an older cottage, 50 years old, that was built um, right on the water's edge. So this boathouse is right next to our cottage, right next to our outdoor living space and our indoor living space. Um, so the the result of putting the landing on this side of the boathouse is that all that traffic is going to go right by our, our living space, uh, which is why we object to it. And I think there are a few things that uh, argue against approving this application. One, it was specifically stated in their variance where they got to build the boathouse that the dock that was in the 30 foot setback would be removed. And furthermore, that the existing structure, the new, the new structure would conform with the 30 foot setback. This does not conform with the 30 foot setback. The pictures that you saw were taken during uh, low water time when it's actually summertime when the boathouse is in use, the landing is substantially over water. I mean, the door was built over water. There's no way it could be accessed without building a dock uh, to get into the boathouse. Um, the objection that it can't be, the boathouse can't be uh, accessed from the upper side is valid. However, the boathouse could be accessed from the other side, uh, which is what we would like to see happen. Uh, to route traffic away from our cottage to uh, give us privacy at the cottage, um, we would like to see the access moved to the other side of the boathouse and the non-permitted dock removed. Uh, the application is trying to call this a landing, but it is, it's over water. I mean, that is what a dock is, is a landing over water. Um, so, you know, this was not, I don't feel that the applicants were honest in their application and that they said they would, they told us that the, uh, that the docking in between our properties would be removed and it's now been uh, rebuilt. And I don't think they ever intended uh, to, to comply with what was, uh, what was stated in their, uh, in their application for the variance to build the boathouse. So those are my remarks. Thank you very much. And uh, is there anyone else here wishing to speak in opposition? Uh, I'm going to ask uh, Mr. Allen if he has any uh, comments. Uh, thank you, through you, Chair Edwards. I, I had provided a um, on my presentation the building permit plans for the uh, the dock and boathouse, which did clearly show a landing that was to access that side door. Um, there was some complications. I believe with the the survey and the location of the high water mark that resulted in that uh, issue. So you know, by and large, the landing was constructed in the location that was envisioned on the building permit application. However, uh, the boathouse door is located over water, uh, which which would prevent the the landing from complying with the zoning bylaw. Okay, thank you. I, I, I don't. I don't believe there was ever an intention not to comply with the bylaw. So I, I think that it's very. It's very rare to see somebody, a property owner, obtain two surveys, and and particular surveys prior and after construction, and and take the steps to uh, to make sure they are compliant with the bylaw. Okay, and I see that uh, the owner, I believe, is is on. Would you like to say something, Mrs. Graham? <clears throat> Oh, sure. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your consideration. Yeah, so the, the landing, again, we just tried to make it as safe as we could to preserve the trees. We love Muskoka. Um, it wasn't safe with the gangplank. I, I've got a little toddler and trying to access the boats. We would we looked at moving the door to a different location, respecting the privacy. We've moved everything back as far as we can. We are considering figuring out, you know, the trees are there, which is helping. If we were to relocate the door, as you've seen the elevation and the amount of trees, it would be a significant uh, decrease to privacy for both um, uh, parties involved. So we think, you know, the best place is to keep it as, as close to the shore as we did. Um, and again, to preserve the amount of trees. Thank you very much. 
If there's no one else here to wishing to speak on this. Okay, are there questions from the members? Uh, yes, Councillor Zabit. Uh, thank you and through you, Chair. Uh, I guess to Mr. Allen, um, I'm looking at figure four on our staff report, which shows, and again, I, I'm sensitive to the, the notion that this is, um, looks like it's uh, just post uh, production of the vote house. But uh, so I'm looking at where it points to the landing and then I see uh, along the side of the boathouse, uh, I don't see a dock there. Was a dock added after, or is there really no dock there at all on that boathouse? Uh, thank you through you, Chair Edwards. Uh, there is no dock that extends beyond that outside wall of the existing boathouse. And there was no intention, sorry, secondary, there's no intention of, uh, of uh, doing that later? Uh, no, the, the bylaw requires a minimum 30 foot side yard setback and that existing dock is built at the 30 foot setback. So yeah, thank uh, you. No, no additions yeah, would be permitted. Good. And that's, that's where I'm going with this. I, you know, I, I'm going to be in support of it. Uh, certainly, uh, I think the, these fine folks have done everything. Uh, like just questions now, Councillor yeah. Zavitz. Yeah, that's it. Are there any other questions from members? Moved by Councillor Nishikawa, second by Councillor Berry. Be it resolved that zoning bylaw amendment application ZBA 0223 bylaw 2023-013 Graham be approved. Now you can have questions and comments. Anyone? Seeing none, all those in favor. And that is carried. Thank you, committee. Have a great day. That's it for me. And seeing that um, the next uh, one is at 1130, we're going to jump over to uh, bylaw enforcement short term rentals. And Mr. Kennedy is here. Thank you. Everybody hear me? All right, uh, good morning, uh, committee. Uh, this report is uh, pretty straightforward. Uh, we are obviously in the process of looking at uh, short-term rentals. Um, council has made the decision to go through a licensing program uh, in regards to this. Uh, so this outlines our um, plan, if you will, for this year uh, to get this going. Um, we are in the process of creating a presentation for committee and council uh, in regards to some of the uh, variable sections that you uh, that you will see in some licensing bylaws, such as uh, number of days uh, people can rent a year, number of nights people can rent per stay. Uh, so we are looking to give a presentation uh, and we are recommending this be done at a special council meeting um, in the near future. Uh, excuse me, so that we can get some input from council um, in regards to those variable sections. We will also talk about what the current statistics are for the amount of uh, short-term rentals we have and a uh, general sense of other uh, municipalities' research and what they're doing um, in the modern day. Uh, after that, uh, we are looking to do a, an engage page, do some public consultation, uh, have an open house, which I would suggest be in the summer months to allow for those seasonal residents to participate, um, have an open house, I would say maybe in July, and then further from that, uh, come back and have a public meeting uh, with a draft bylaw that will be presented at that public meeting and allow for the public to comment on, on that further. Um, after that, um, we will take a next draft to either committee or council, depending on the amount of changes that need to be made, um, hopefully for the approval from everybody at the table and uh, and then work on the implementation. So that is all. If uh, there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. Yes, questions. I'll start with uh, the mayor. <clears throat> uh, thank you and through you, Chair. Um, I'm glad to see that this is moving forward. I, I, one of the things that I've learned from reading uh, on, on these licensing programs is the success of enforcement often depends on the 
quality of the software that you use to pull all the information from whatever source to identify those who are, are renting uh, space, but not actually licensed. Is that something that you've thought about? I realize it's probably too early to start looking at it, but at some point in time, this only works if we can catch the people that don't take the, uh, the that just don't want to register with us. And there is a really neat, compelling way that they can pull information from uh, the, the, the web uh, to identify people that may be offsite on licensing. That is a question. Yes, go yeah, ahead. Uh, through the chair, um, I, I'm familiar. The, the main one you're going to see with online platforms uh, for regulation is Granicus, um, host compliance. Uh, so we have, or I have spoken to Granicus on multiple occasions already. Um, the statistics that you will see in the presentation will be from Granicus um, on the amount of uh, short-term rental places that they have on those online platforms. There are others now popping up though. Uh, Prince Edward County, for example, uses a new one called Haribi. Uh, and then I just, I don't remember what the other one's name is, but there's two other ones that I was just uh, notified about um, early this week. So there are some other competing companies that are coming up uh, with Granicus, but I think for the most part, you will commonly see um, Granicus be that online platform that enforcement uses. And we can we will get into that uh, during the presentation as well. Thank you. And I'm going to go to Councillor Zabich and then Councillor Roberts. Uh, thank you. And through you, Chair, to, uh, to Rob Kennedy. Rob, thank you. Um, I wonder if you could read, I believe it was the second sentence in your presentation, if you could read that again. I believe it's a second or third sentence. Um, that council has made a decision to license. Can you could you read that to me? Just read that aloud. Sorry. So so what I mean by that is is council has already passed a resolution uh, to bring for staff to bring back a licensing bylaw for short term rentals. Uh, so this is the the way we are planning on doing that. Thank you. Secondarily, I, I want to be clear. I, it is not my impression, if you will, and again, it's all about the language here. Um, it is not my impression that our previous council, which I was a part of, and or this new council has actually embraced the word licensing in terms of, um, I, I want to be really clear about this. I, I do believe that we have, as a council, have had a, a the uh, emotional uh, link to this topic with exploring, you know, investigating and understanding. And I, I thought that's where where this thing is right now. I'm hoping that we, you know, in terms of licensing, I'm going to have lots to say on that. I don't I'm not so sure that that's where I think we should go and others may or may not agree, but I'm just going to say here and now that um, it feels like we're further along on this than I'm aware we are. I don't believe I've ever voted to license uh, short-term rental in the township of Muskoka Lakes. And I, uh, I think we need to be very careful with our language uh, in front of the public, which is our forum. Because uh, I'm hearing a lot of people don't, you know, the, People, are, ignorance is bliss, right? They don't understand the language like we do because we have these experts in front of us to to educate us. Um, I think we need to be very careful with the, the languages, I guess my point, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Chair, and through you to um, to uh, Mr. Kennedy. Um, in your uh, in, in your research and in, in your presentation back to Council, I'd be very interested in learning the pros and cons of um, accommodation tax. Does it go hand in hand with licensing? Um, and so I'd like to know a lot more about that and, and how we could use accommodation tax licensing or even nothing as as um, as proposed by uh, uh, Councillor Zabitz. And I, I too don't think, I think we've just been in the dialogue part. We're just looking for um solutions so that's more of a comment and i'll say by the, we have the comments later on so the question is will your report include um information on accommodation tax in 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 orchestration with uh licensing or whatever do you understand am i am i okay uh, understand <laughs> through, through the chair short answer is we will we will have something on the municipal accommodation tax um, yeah, in the presentation. I'd like to see that as well, because I hear Huntsville and some other municipalities are doing it with their licensing system. 
And I have, have been told at uh, conferences, there's only two things you can do with short-term rental, either license them or ignore them. And that, Councillor uh, King, Kent, sorry. Uh, thank you. Um, and through you, the, the question I have as a, you know, I wasn't here for the prior councils. I, I thought we were still in the evaluation phase. And I spoke with another counselor last week and asked the question, who are we licensing? Are we licensing the Airbnbs? Are we licensing the individuals? I don't think we've gotten to the bottom of any of these issues. I would suspect that we're really still at the thinking stage. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I don't I don't know what the vote was you took. It would be helpful if you could elicit for me what exactly the vote was that was taken at whatever prior council meeting this was uh, for the new councilors involved. Um, I'm, you know, I'm in favor of evaluating uh, improvements. I'm in favor of tackling problems, but I'm not necessarily in favor of putting in place an entire large licensing department inside our council that's going to cause a lot of bureaucracy and cost. So I want to find out what the best answer and solution to the problem, including limitations on duration and other alternatives. So it would be great if somebody could tell me what the resolution was that was actually signed. Okay, thank you. Mr. Pink. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, through you, I can provide a, a bit of background for uh, committee members, certainly those uh, uh, new committee members that uh, were involved in these discussions previously, but uh, staff brought forward a, a report actually in early 2016 to address this issue, actually well before most municipalities were even considering uh, the issue. I remember talking with my peers about it and uh, they were hoping it would go away, um, but I think staff recognized that uh, the wave was coming um, and that term of council uh, studied uh, the short-term rental issue at, at pretty, uh, extensive depths. We had presentations from uh, various other uh, members of the community who had concerns uh, with the use in their area. We had presentations from planners, uh, presentations from legal counsel as to options. Uh, we studied uh, the town of Blue Mountains really was the trailblazer uh, in this regard. And we uh, staff attended conferences where they presented uh, and forwarded that information on. That term of council, we put together a steering committee uh, who studied the issue. Various groups were involved in that from uh, OPP, by law enforcement, again, members of the community, both renters uh, and neighbors to uh, rentals. And uh, I think as the chair sort of uh, bluntly or aptly put it, uh, really at the end of the day, the conclusion was you either, you either license it is really the only tool if you want to get a control on it. Uh, and staff were directed to uh, prepare a licensing bylaw and staff did do that. Ultimately, though, the steering committee and council of the day opted uh, for a code of conduct, uh, but they did recognize when they approved that code of conduct, it was a multifaceted resolution that looked at uh, enhancing bylaw enforcement resources, uh, reviewing bylaws and updating bylaws as needed, and working with this code of conduct and essentially with the recognition that we would evaluate as time went on. And the municipality has largely done that. As we know, we've enhanced bylaw enforcement resources. Uh, we've updated a number of bylaws, but the concerns in the community persist. And if anything, likely have increased uh, from what I sense. Um, so that code of conduct has been in place since, I think it was approximately um, uh, around 2018 or so, I think it was passed. And a licensing bylaw was prepared, but it was shelved. Uh, fast forward to the previous term of council. Uh, again, we staff provided an update on the previous uh, history and research that was done. And there was a resolution passed, I believe it was in the summer of uh, 2022, uh, to bring a that licensing bylaw back to council uh, for consideration, as well as put the necessary resources in the budget uh, to consider uh, its implementation. So, as bylaw enforcement staff are gaining familiarity, we've updated the tree and site bylaw and the dark sky bylaw and the fireworks bylaw. We're learning uh, and want to make this process as smooth as possible. We thought we'd try a slightly different approach as this is a really a brand new initiative uh, and a very potentially complex, contentious one. Uh, we thought we'd start with uh, this report to have committee and council's concurrence on the process, as well as a robust engagement process. And, and a proper review uh, before we go down that road. So 
long story short, I don't think council has made a decision. You certainly haven't voted to pass a licensing bylaw, but all the research in the past and all the direction in the past is to pursue that path. And staff has laid out in this report a path forward for uh, further consideration of that licensing. And we'll dive into the accommodation tax, the uh, financial implications of licensing, uh, the pros and cons of licensing or other regulatory options. As the report notes, you know, we can back, uh, back up even to, you know, really the, the issues, the background work we've done to date, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, uh, again, in, in all my research, uh, looking at other municipalities, what they've done, the nuances and unique, unique nature of the township, uh, really licensing is really the only option, in my opinion, that will work in our township if uh, committee and council wants to pursue uh, regulating short-term rentals in any fashion. And, and the reason I say that, not to get into the sort of weeds of this meeting, but and we'll save it for that um, uh, presentation meeting, uh, really the other option available to you is zoning. And zoning is more of a blunt tool of really prohibiting uh, it outright. And it really won't work that well, in my opinion, in our township, um, because under the Planning Act, the municipality can't be retroactive. So if a zoning bylaw was passed and said the rental and defined short-term rental and prohibited it, um, I can assure you that almost every owner would claim that the activity pre-existed the passage of that zoning bylaw, and there'd be no evidence to really um, enforce or, uh, or implement that zoning tool in those situations. So licensing is an ability to really, what are the benefits of it is, is really to control those concerns that are arising and, and really and I can go into much greater depth, but to keep it brief at this point, I think in my mind, really one of the great benefits of licensing is, um, you know, a lot of those tools are already in place. We have a noise bylaw, we have parking bylaws, all these protections are in place. However, if an owner were to contravene X number and on a demerit point system or whatever system we, uh, we derive, you have an ability to revoke that license. And that's really the great tool that you're gaining by the licensing bylaw. It weeds out the, the bad uh, landlords or bad actors or bad business operators. And it gives you an ability to put other controls in place as well. Uh, and again, we'll certainly get into all those details in uh, Mr. Kennedy's future presentation, but I hope that gives some background on the work council's done to date, uh, why we've brought this forward uh, today. And, uh, and again, why we're suggesting uh, the process that we've laid out in the in the staff report. Thank you. Thank you very much. I am going to. Can go I just to... have a follow up? Can I can just I just have second. a follow up to my question? Yeah, just one second. Okay. There are other in in line, and then I I will get to you. Yes. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Good morning, members of the committee. Uh, just to follow up on Mr. Pink's comments. So my recollection was last July when this was discussed. There was a desire from committee because of those continuing community concerns about short-term rentals. You'd ask staff to update the bylaw that had been previously presented uh, to uh, to committee and council, and so presumably that's under the guise of wanting to explore the system. So rather than simply providing you a bylaw, which everybody would react to and potentially from the public, staff are coming forward to you with a process to to develop a bylaw, understand your areas of concern and work with committee to sort of shape the concepts and then come back to you with this bylaw that you've requested, be prepared. And if you, if at some point you don't wanna proceed, then you can stop that. It's your choice as to whether or not you proceed to the public and wish to, wish to pass it. So um, I, I think uh, I'll, I'll stop there and staff can answer any questions further to that. But I think this is just sort of a furtherance of what you've previously requested. It's just a different approach, which I think involves committee a little bit more in its development. Thank you. I will let you have a, a rebuttal, then I'm going to Councillor Roberts, Councillor Mazin, and then back to uh, Councillor Zabich. Uh, May and, you uh, and, and, Sorry, and Councillor Nishikawa. Okay. Um, Councillor Roberts? Oh, I'm confused then. Um, yeah, me too. Uh, Councillor, just a point of order, uh, Councillor Kent had a rebuttal or a follow-up okay, well, question. Oh, okay, right. we'll, we'll, we'll go to her, then we'll come back to you. Thank Councilor you. Kent. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you to Director Pink and um, um, uh, 
Derek. That was really very helpful for me. Um, I appreciate the fact, I think it's way better if we have a process that's more, rather than saying jumping into a bylaw preparation, I think we should figure out what we want to put into the bylaw before we go craft it. Because then you're already in there and now you're unwinding it. It's way better to set the framework for the bylaw, what we're thinking. And I know you guys are way down the and many, many of you are way down the road on this and then prepare the bylaw. So I appreciate the process, I think would be a way better process for me in particular as a council. Uh, number two, I would just request if possible, could we get a, could we get, you keep comparing it to Collingwood, but I don't see the similarity there. I see the similarity more to Lake of Bays, uh, Huntsville, uh, other uh, water access uh, kind of, seasonal property kind of places. And I'm wondering if um, we could get the data on what those people have done when we have our first discussion about that, if it hasn't been presented already. If it has, maybe you could forward it on to me and other counselors if it's been previously given out. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I'll go to Councilor Roberts. Thank you, Chair. So I just have two uh, points for input. Uh, or, and, and a comment. Uh, basically, I'm very supportive of the process that's presented to us. I, I like how we're moving forward. Just that it's uh, it's going to be uh, another year before I really put anything in place, but that's all right. Uh, I guess that we'll have to go with that. So there's my two points are, um, I would like to see anything here that we do. It must be self-funding. It can't be in the, ta the back of taxes, or, or, of taxpayers. So, um, because there's a lot of tax taxpayers that are not involved in short-term rentals, and so it, all costs should be on the uh, on on the, on short-term rental uh, um, properties. Uh, the second thing I'll make a comment on is that uh, when I was doing my research, um, it was either Nova Scotia or New Brunswick. I can't remember which has actually gone for a provincial uh, short-term rental program. But one of the things I found interesting is that. Uh, they they made it mandatory, and maybe we can't do this. That all all um, now I'm speaking of we. I don't think we can. Uh, all advertisements must have the short term. Uh, it must have the uh, licensing agreement number on their ads. But I guess that's more of a provincial thing. So uh, it's just a comment. Thank you. That's what I have to to present to offer. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kenny. Would you like to respond, please? Yeah, through the chair, just for clarity, there there are sections in other uh, municipal bylaws that do state that uh, every short-term rental that is licensed does have to have their license number included on their advertisement. So that that is in a municipal bylaw. We can certainly put that in if we if we choose to do so. Thank you very much, Councillor Mazin. Uh, thank you, and through you. Uh, I'm going to blend, I guess, my comment with a question. My overall comment would be that I'm very supportive of this process. I think it's a good way for us to be ensuring every stakeholder group has a chance on many occasions to input. So I appreciate staff's uh, new approach. Uh, the second question, and it comes off of, I believe, Director Pink, you were explaining in the kickoff meeting all the background stud studies and options to be presented and I'm I'm just curious to know regulatory options just uh, at this point I've heard a talk about uh, licensing are there other options that are contemplated or am I putting the cart before the horse uh, through the chair uh, yes the short answer is there there are other options as I mentioned but uh I would agree in the sense that, you know, today is really about the process mm -hmm. uh, and we can certainly get into these discussions at the, at the kickoff meeting uh, through the presentation. But as I mentioned, there's licensing, there's zoning, uh, there's uh, some municipalities have opted for just a simple registry and sort of all things in between. Um, so we can certainly uh, review those and, and include benchmarking. I think to uh, Councillor Kent's questions, uh, you know, we can certainly include what other municipalities or uh, peers have, have done uh, through this process. But today is really about, um, as the CO eloquently stated, really, this is a, a new initiative. And rather than bring you a bylaw uh, at a meeting such as this and uh, and try to piece it all together, we feel uh, laying out this process uh, uh, will make that process go a little bit smoother. Uh, and that's really what the direction we're looking for today and a consensus that it really be a likely a special planning committee meeting as opposed to a, a regular uh, committee meeting. So, and then staff can canvas dates if, uh, if approved. 
Thank you. I do Thank support you. the process. Thank you. Thank you very much. Because we've been getting comments on this, I will read the resolution, even though I would take it, and then we will go to questions or comments. Uh, moved by Councillor Burry, second by Mayor Kelly. Be it resolved that committee endorse the process to consider and develop regulations for short-term rentals outlined in staff report bylaw 2023-03. Okay, now we can go to... Uh, it. And I believe Councillor uh, Nishikawa would like to say something. Thank you. Um, so I, I never got to share. I would have, I should have found an, an opportunity to share what we learned at Roma. And so if I could have a little bit of leeway, I'm just going to read some of my notes um, because it was very, very informative for me in particular. And I had been to a presentation many, many years ago uh, at when Blue Mountain first brought that in. So we and I it was a it was a great conference that we learned a lot about their failures and pluses and and actually how much it cost them because that was a big important way back then that bylaw cost them more than a million dollars. So uh, I, just quickly, I'll just read a few of my comments or notes that I made. Uh, so FOCA put on the presentation, and I would suggest that we, uh, if anybody has that opportunity to get a copy of that presentation, it would be very informative for the rest of council to, to review. Um, interestingly, uh, you know, with some of the, the notes, um, the short term, the, like the different comments, lead me to believe that in fact we should try to create another little committee and I, if it was like a counselor from each ward there's just so much with this that in fact they could work closer with the bylaw officer um, to come up with some of these nuances because there's so much involved um, so i would put that on the mayor because i i do think that that's an important um, thing to look at i don't have to be on it but i'm just saying that if if every uh, if there was council on each ward, it probably save time in the process. Um, you know, there was conversations about Kawartha Lakes and the garbage. I mean, that was that's something else to to take into consideration. Uh, I did note this that having the solicitor from Tiny come to speak from Township of Muskoka Lakes um, would be very informative. And I, I spoke with others about that as well. So I just make that suggestion out there. Um, you know, we talked about uh, the number of rentals and, and mostly what I got from this is to not proceed with this license if it's not gonna pay for itself. And the other issue was that it shouldn't be under planning. And maybe Derek, I, I would ask you to comment because that, that was a comment that was made a couple of times that in fact, that this should be under a, a sort of a separate department or something like that. It, it wasn't a planning issue per se. Uh, so I'd like to find out a little bit more about that. Um, there, you know, there was a couple of other experts um, discussed. The software is a big deal, very big deal. Um, and again, it goes back to that comment about um, this thing should be paying for itself. Uh, interestingly enough, I, at least what I gathered from Prince Edward County, they've been doing it for some time, but it's not been an easy goal. It's been lots and lots of challenges. So again, there's an awful lot. I, I have lots of notes and lots of things. Um, I just feel that, again, it could be a special council meeting, but I, I really kind of think that it's going to be a longer process, and that if, if other you know councillors were involved in just that little special committee, we would be further ahead um, in getting narrowing down some of these issues. I will speak about back in well, I guess it was Alice Murphy's uh, a time as a mayor. We had a situation in Bala where um, a short-term rental. Uh, was taking place and it was again a very very small accommodation um a three bedroom uh, location that would have anywhere up to 15 to 20 people staying that in there and it was a nightly rental 
uh, next to families. Um, there was lots of, it was a, a really ugly situation. And what we tried to look at was the fact that they were still not hooked up. And this was right in town, um, but they weren't hooked up to sewer. They had the ability to hook up to sewer, but they weren't. So we sort of tried to kind of see if we could go after them from the fact that they're over capacity in their septic. I don't think we were successful, but we do know, um, at least in, in, in our ward, in Ward A, that there are a number of these rentals that in fact they're two bedroom houses or two bedroom accommodations. And because they're being rented out for more than a thousand dollars a day, they're jamming it packed with a peep with full of people. Um, same with putting beds in sheds, those kind of things. Um, so it, it, I don't know how we're gonna, I think that septic thing is an important part too, and how we can try to nail that down. There's an awful lot about this, but I just, um, I do truly feel, Mr. Mayor, that I think we should have a little committee that is gonna really dive in and then report back um, with, with Mr. Kennedy on the steps that they're making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there any other comments other than uh, Councillor Zavich? I will come back to you after all the other comments. Uh, Mayor Kelly. Uh, thank you. I just want to make sure I got clarification from Councillor Nishikawa. When you mention a, a committee, you mean to step in before it comes to the whole? Yes. Okay. And okay, so a smaller working group than the, the entire, and and it would reach its conclusions and deliver something closer to a finished product to the rest of the group for approval. And interim reports. Okay. Yeah. I just want to understand. Thank you. Councillor Zavich. I have no, I have no, through you, Chair, I have no idea why you've excluded me from this conversation. So I'm just going to shut up for now. Well, no, the reason was that you had already spoke on it and I was going around and let everyone else have their say, but you are welcome to say something. If you don't, that's fine as well. Are there any other questions or comments on this? Yes, Mr. Hamm. Thanks, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, following up from uh, Councillor Nishikawa's points, uh, I did uh, reach out to Roma as uh, we all went, uh, or the mayor and her and I went, did follow up and uh, did receive the presentations that were uh, presented in the workshop that she attended. So I did forward those to Mr. Pink and Mr. Kennedy. They're still available. I'm sure they'd be happy to include that in their background information package. Uh, as we go through this process, I just say that uh, the reason that uh, the, the approach envisioned this committee was uh, we suspected that given the breadth of the issue across the municipality, each and every member of uh, committee and council would want to participate at one point. But certainly if committee wishes to uh, consider a smaller group to uh, boil it up, if you will, that's another option. But we just thought it might be uh, more advantageous to have it out in the open right from the get-go with the entire group. So uh, I'll, I'll leave that to you to, to weigh in on. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? Seeing none, I've read the resolution. All those in favor? Is there anyone opposed? That is carried. Thank you very much, Mr. Kennedy. Excellent presentation. And since it's past 11.30, I'm gonna to go to uh, 7A. And that is Mr. Sharp. We're not hearing anything. Oh. 
looks like Rob reason. turned my microphone off. Sorry about that. Okay. I'll start over. <laughs> right on. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> All right, I will start over. Thank you, Chair Edwards. By way of introduction, a phased condominium description in the name of Legacy Lakeside Resort has been draft approved, consisting of 43 resort accommodation units in three phases. The subject property is known municipally as 2054 Peninsula Road. Phase one has been built, uh, has received final approval, and has been registered. The owner has submitted an application to the District of Muskoka to amend the conditions of draft approval of the phased condominium description to address the proposed phasing of the development. District, district staff have uh, requested comments from the township. The proposed amendment will adjust the boundary of draft approved phase two to include 25 units instead of 15. And staff understand that the owner's reasoning is to convey units that have been constructed as soon as possible. The proposed amendment will also adjust the boundary of draft approved phase three to include only three units instead of 13 and to include lands uh, adjacent to the shoreline of Lake Rosso. Staff understand that the owner's reasoning is again to convey constructed units as soon as possible. And staff also understand that the owner needs to continue to maintain control of the shoreline, which currently forms part of draft approved phase two. I would note that the amendments are rather technical in nature, and I have recommended that the district be advised that the township has no objection. I have no further comments at this time, and I would be happy to assist committee with any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Sharp. And uh, do we have uh, the agent here? There he is, okay. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Stefan Sherback, Planscape Inc., uh, 104 Kimberly and Bracebridge, P1L 1Z8. Um, the staff report in front of you is uh, complete and thorough. Mr. Sharp's presentation is also accurate. I'm just here if there's any questions. Um, I really have nothing to add uh, um, as everything is uh, in front of you. Happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak in support? Anyone in opposition? Okay, are there questions from the members? Uh, yes, Councillor Kent. Um, just for history, uh, why did we have the phasing of the build outs set up the way they were? And if there was a rationale for that, what are we thinking about moving 10 more units to phase two from phase three? I don't really. I see any reason to object to it. I'm just trying to understand why it was set up the way we were and what, we might, what, what I might be missing. Thank you for the question. Uh, Mr. Sh uh, Mr. Shervak, can you answer that, please? Uh, thank you through you to the councillor. Um, the, the rationale at the time was just a, a, a simple phasing mechanism, um, just with, uh, a, it's just a numbers game. They just really wanted a certain number of units to be approved in each uh, phase. And since then, and uh, with the uh, you know delays with some of the construction and uh, the number of building permits that have been issued, they're just looking to consolidate essentially the last two phases with the exception of a, a handful of units. Um, again, just to close things down, occupy them and just get the uh, resort moving um, as quickly as possible. Thank you. Any more questions? I read the resolution. Moved by Mayor Kelly, second by Member Nishikawa, be it resolved that the District of Muskoka be advised that the Township of Muskoka Lakes has no objection to the amendment to the draft approved phased condominium description number C 2017 5. Now, any questions or comments? Okay, I'll call the question. All those in favor? And that is carried. Thank you. Have a good day. Thank you. And now we'll hear from Mr. Pink over the camping over water. You turn it off on me. Can everyone hear me? Great. Um, 
So I prepared a uh, brief report on your agenda packages. Uh, for those returning committee members, you may recall it was in March uh, 2022. Uh, we had a discussion and provided comments to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry on better managing uh, floating accommodations that were cropping up in uh, other municipalities. Uh, the Ministry has now proposed amendments to Ontario Regulation 161.17. And uh, in response to the uh, comments that were previously forwarded from area municipalities, uh, the notable changes that the ministry are proposing, they're uh, proposing to reduce the number of days that a person can camp on the water in one location from 21 to 7, uh, increasing the distance that a camping unit must move after those seven days from 100 meters to one kilometer, uh, and adding a new condition to prohibit camping uh, within 300 meters of a developed shoreline. And I think most notably changing the definition of a camping unit to exclude uh, floating homes or the issue that I think uh, really brought this uh, to a head. Uh, the proposed amendments also include um, some greater clarity in regards to uh, swim rafts, in particular limiting their maximum size. It's uh, 15 square meters in a residential area, 40 square meters uh, for commercial properties. Um, so ultimately, although the route that the ministry is proposing is uh, not what uh, the municipality recommended last year, I think it's uh, definitely an adequate uh, response uh, to the issue. I think it will control uh, the concerns that were raised, uh, but I have suggested in the report a few uh, additional recommendations in addition to our support uh, that we could suggest uh, to the ministry, including looking at a definition of developed shoreline. It's not really clear uh, where this 300 meters is going to be measured from. Uh, adding some additional clarification on swim rafts. I think uh, they should give some thought about to uh, perhaps setbacks uh, from either shore, how far out in the lake these can go. Uh, can they be in front of neighboring property owners, for example, uh, as well as potentially a limit on height. And of course, most notably, just uh, to make the ministry very clear that all enforcement of this regulation will continue to remain with, uh, with them. Um, I think it uh, wouldn't hurt to solidify that in our response. Uh, so staff uh, is suggesting the report be forward. I would uh, lastly note uh, that the commenting period ends on April 11th. I believe that's before our next council meeting. So uh, just a uh, notification that if we want to forward these comments, they should be forwarded before ratification by council. And with that, uh, available to answer any questions. Thank you very much. The questions, yes, Councilor Nizakawa. Thank you. Um, David, with the swim draft thing, I'm wondering, like, I, could we add... So, so I, I've experienced where people are, are getting these big blow up floaty things. Um, so they don't look like a raft. I, I, that's my concern. And, and some of these things are huge and in fact are impeding other boaters getting to their own dock um, because they're right on the property line. It, like it, it's a, a sort of a strange situation, but um, could we add that kind of language about whatever the, those are called, like what the technical words would be? Um, because it is a big problem here. Uh, you know, there's some some folks that have taken up a whole bay. Uh, and so, yeah, where else can that conversation uh, go with that? So through the chair, I think the short answer is yes. Uh, this is your opportunity to comment to the ministry. So I think it depends a little bit of how detailed you wish to get. I think if the concern is about size, I think one of the benefits of the proposed regulation right now, I don't believe there's any size limit and they're proposing 15 square meters. So I think whether that's the right size or not, you know, certainly I'll let committee uh, debate that, but at least they're moving in the direction of limiting the size. I think, and perhaps I'm misreading it, but the way I've read the proposed regulations, they would consider it separate rafts if you tie them together. That seems like a pretty easy loophole to me. So I've suggested to them that they look at that uh, if that's not the intent. And you'll note um, my other suggestion is to look at setbacks from neighbors as the concern and also potentially a limit to height. So we've included that in, if that's the concern about the overall size and the height, I think they will be addressed by the regulation or the proposed amendments. I think uh, I'll leave it again to committee whether you wish to debate uh, being more detailed in your comments if you have a specific size or a specific height or a specific setback that you wish to relay to the committee. Uh, but I think, uh, that is largely in the in our suggested comments to the ministry. Thank you. Anyone else? Questions? Yeah. Uh, um, well, then why don't I I read the resolution and we can get to both. I think that would be the easiest way. 
Moved by Councillor Kent, second by Councillor Mazin. Be it resolved that staff report plan 2023-62 be forwarded to the Ministry of Natural Resources and Forestry as the township's response to their proposal to amend Ontario Regulation 161-17 under the Public Lands Act. Now we can have questions or comments. Yes, Mayor Kelly. Uh, thank you, and through you to, uh, well, to everyone as a comment, uh, a couple of things jump out here. First of all, I, I'm really surprised that there's jurisdiction at the provincial level over these things. Uh, I applaud that they think there is, um, but it leads me to wonder if they have jurisdiction over floaty rafts uh, uh, floating above the bed, bed. Why don't they have jurisdiction over uh, more destructive things like uh, you know, boats that cause environmental hazard that traverse over their floor. I think that the extension is uh, should be obvious. The second thing and the biggest thing for me, or the real quick one, I think volume is a measure of uh, aggravation for these inflatable rafts, not just height, because height's not, if it's a diving tower, that's one thing, but it's when they become inflatable airstream trailers. That, uh, that they start to become a real problem. The third thing, and I think this is just for our own internal communications issues, you know, we, we keep getting dragged into the issue of whether we're working hard enough to, to, to do everything we can to prevent springtime flooding. Uh, the enforcement here is clearly MNRF. It's, in my humble opinion, practically impossible to enforce because somebody's going to have to be logging the movement of each specific floating unit and whether it's moved a meter or a kilometer or 300 meters over seven days two days or three days those complaint calls are all going to come to us those issues are going to come to us and i think just like we've built a, a, a front end on our website to make it clear mnrf is responsible for floods this is an mnrf issue they think they can enforce it i hope they can but i i i'm more inclined to believe that to the extent it's not enforceable, we're going to get the phone calls. We're going to get the requests. It's going to come to Rob Kennedy, the whoever. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any other comments? I don't see any. Any final comment, Mr. Pink? The meeting might conclude before 12. I won't say anything. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I, I have noticed like when they're, they're, they're talking floating accommodation and that there was one on the Credit River that somebody built a house on the floodplain and they tried to stop him, but he put it on concrete and he called it a boat. It took them three years to get rid of it. So anyway, I've read the most. Oh, sorry, Mr. Councillor Roberts. Sorry, Chair, I put my, my hand up at the last moment um, just um, on um, on the sides of these uh, floating structures. Um, um, are we going to comment at all on them that we would like to see them less than than 15 square meters? We Are we going to do anything there or just leave it quiet? I'll ask Mr. Pink that because uh, the thing is, is when you start getting houseboats in and that like on the Trent Severn waterway, which I had rented okay. and that it does create a problem on our lakes and mm -hmm. that, and I don't know if there's a bylaw that we can do with, with our boat ramps that you, a certain size is the only boat you can launch. Yeah. My question more pertaining to the floating raft. Sorry, I wasn't clear. Okay. Sorry. I was thinking uh, as well as, uh, like the houseboats as well, and that, uh, Mr. Pink? I was just going to, again, clarify that's correct. I thought the question was more to do with swim rafts, so keep in mind the ministries sort of combine the two issues a little bit in this proposed regulation. As to the size, I don't profess to be a swim raft expert, although my kids do love them. Um, they seem to like the high ones too, I apologize. Um, whether, you know, 15 square meters is the right size, I think, again, I looked at committee to debate that. Um, it seemed you know, generally appropriate to me. I think where I sometimes hear the complaints or concerns from the community is when a neighbor places it in front of another neighbor's uh, property or, or boathouse. So that's where I've suggested perhaps, um, uh, you know, the ministry putting some controls to ensure that it's in front of one's own property. 
um, is uh, perhaps a, a good tool as opposed to, um, you know, does it need to be smaller than 15 square meters? Again, I'll, I'll leave it to committee to, to debate what the right uh, size is, but, uh, but it seemed generally acceptable to me. Thank you very much. Uh, Councilor Roberts, you still have your hand up to have a question or a supplemental? Yes, supplemental. Thank you very much, Chair. Yes, I think that um, uh, the lines that uh, Mr. Pink is going along, that uh, whatever we can do to ensure that if these structures are there, that they are um, in front of uh, the uh, the property owner, in front of the property, the owner of that floating raft, rather than go into the neighbors or and it doesn't restrict access to uh, boat houses and et cetera. Uh, so I, I would look, I would, I would support anything that we could do there. Okay. Uh, Councilor Kent. Uh, this is for Director Pick. Um, if you are asking for input on the size, correct me if I'm wrong, is 15 meters by 15 meters is like a 45 by 45 foot platform. Am I, if I've done the math wrong, tell me I'm wrong. That seems like a very, very large swim raft to me as a homeowner who has had swim rafts in the past. And they're about, I don't know, maybe 10 by 10 in terms of feet, not meters, uh, 15 feet by 15 feet at the max. But this seems like it's a half a house if it's 15, 45 by 45, unless I'm missing the judgments. I would definitely ask that we try to, at least for lakes on our size, uh, that they be reduced to a much smaller um, size. And I'm differentiating between a swim raft and a floating um, structure. Uh, my second qu question is, is there language in here about how far offshore they can be? Because I think part of the problem is people will start to push them farther and farther out. Uh, whereas if you keep them closer to shore, then they become the responsibility of the homeowner. Or the cottage owner, and um, it's not likely you're going to invade into other people's boating traffic lanes. Um, I didn't see anything in the, or I didn't read, maybe I didn't read it carefully enough, in there limiting or saying how far out they would be allowed to be, even if it's going to be impossible to uh, monitor it. The language should be in the bylaw saying that it shouldn't be any further out than X. Uh, but I don't know exactly what that amount ought to be. So thank the, you very much. Uh, Mr. Pink, did you work that out uh, feet and inches? <laughs> yes, so uh, 15 square meters is approximately 160 square feet in size. Um, so that would be your size limit. And staff did suggest, uh, again, not uh, didn't propose a specific number, uh, but the report which would be forwarded does suggest, um, again, not just ensuring that it's in front of one's own property, but also a restriction or control on the extent that one could be pushed out into the lake to again encourage it closer to shore as you suggested again i think further to councillor nishikawa's comments or question if committee wishes to be more detailed or specific uh, and put numbers to the ministry again uh, certainly uh, we can note that in the resolution and uh, and forward them along the swim raft in at windermere beach do you know the size of that because it's, I don't think it's anywhere near that. And uh, there, it would probably put, I've seen as many as 10 people on it. I apologize, I don't know offhand the, the size of that swim raft. We should maybe check that because if, if that'll do on, on a public beach, I don't think you need larger on, uh, on uh, private. It is my thought, but uh, I don't know if anybody else has any, uh, any thoughts on that, but. Uh, I'd say even uh, something like 10 by 10. Pardon? Even 12 by 12, okay. That's, that is a huge raft, yes. Councilor Mazin. Thank you. I was listening about the rafts, but I was actually going back and trying to reread the report actually to have the definition, probably just for my own clarity, I am now asking a question. The definition, of a camping unit because it, it to the genesis of this while i do appreciate the rafts it is a significant issue uh it was a really significant issue in some of our neighboring municipalities as you've noted to have these floating housing accommodations 
And it seems to me as I'm rereading that the report that we had put forward or the request we had put forward, this doesn't necessarily satisfy, like the definition isn't clear. So I, I just want, I guess, assurance slash uh, an understanding as to what would this allow now on our lakes? It, this is a big issue in some other municipalities. I think there's a real fear in our community that we're gonna, going to see quite a few of these housing accommodations on the lakes. So through the, uh, through the chair, um, that's correct. Uh, our neighboring property owners, I think in particular Georgia Bay, uh, had some significant issues uh, where they're seeing uh, at least one, if not a number of these, and there's concern that they may uh, spread. I think there was a, you know, a recent CBC uh, presentation or a news piece on uh, potentially expanding that. And I think these regulations are, are meant to address it. I think, however, I think in my opinion, the the changes that the ministry is proposing to the definition of camping unit will address the concern. Okay. And I think they are relatively clear. It's noted in the report there, uh, the definition is going to be clarified to specifically exclude floating accommodations or float homes. So I think, again, I believe the intent or the premise originally of the original uh, regulation is to allow houseboats and people to camp on public lands. But if it's truly camping or navigation or that type of use, not not type, uh, not an abuse of the uh, of that free land use to to uh, place essentially a home on a barge, as as the right. chair noted in the, on the Credit River, and then simply move it 100 meters once a month, and essentially utilize it as a floating home. Uh, as I said, when we reported last year and in this report, township official plan policies and zoning provisions have been debated and uh, revised and updated you know, numerous times to really protect the waterfront character. And that's why we have lock coverages and setbacks and limitations on two-story boathouses. And this, this use that's cropping up in Georgia Bay seems to be a loophole or a way to circumvent those good rules and policies that we have in place. I think what the ministry is proposing by excluding these float homes in the definition, it will essentially nip this in the bud. Um, like I said, they've just combined the swim rafts and kind of between the two issues, they're sensitive to a lot of a lot of people so appreciate the good debate on the on the topics thank you and just if, if i may just to, so this is when you were talking uh director pink about um the definition of uh, the shoreline structures this is where this becomes relevant and then i mean really on, on all of our lakes the 300 meters into the lake would address this correct Yes. Yeah, so to okay. through the chair to that point, um, I think it's a relatively minor uh, point, but in my read of the proposed regulations, it's clear that uh, when you move uh, or if you were to have a camping unit over water that's still allowed, you have to be at least 300 meters from a developed shoreline. And that includes boathouses or docks. But it's not very clear whether that includes a property owner who has a developed shore or a developed property, but perhaps doesn't have a boathouse. Can you still park your camping unit in front? And it's just not clear in uh, what they release to the public whether that 300 meters is from developed property lines or just boathouses and docks. We have some very large properties in our township or some properties that may not have a, a boathouse, and it doesn't seem appropriate to be able to put a, uh, a camping unit in front of those, um, you know, just because they don't have a boathouse. Um, so again, that's more of a suggestion uh, to the ministry to clarify that. I think their intent would be to prohibit it. Um, and it's just some food for thought for them to, to nail that down in their final draft. Thank you. Councillor Ken. Uh, just to follow up, um, if you if you would would wanted my input, I'll give it to you. I've just done some calculations. I think that perhaps, Director Pink, that the um, the swim raft item should be distinguished between a residential and a commercial property. Uh, I mean, like a residential cottage doesn't need a swim raft any bigger than, I mean, I don't know, pick a number, 15 by 15 feet or 20 by 20 feet. Uh, but theoretically, it should be based on the, the size of the shoreline. Uh, and then a commercial property, I see much more unlimited size you know, if they want to put a massive structure up in front of Windermere House, I'm not going to, you know, that's going to be a separate issue. But I think commercial versus residential, 
the limitation should perhaps be set that way. And I'm just giving you a suggestion for some ideas you might go back with. And then off the, the I think a limitation on how far offshore something can be uh, for a residential property, it probably shouldn't be more than 50 feet, um, you know, or 25 meters at the, at the longest. Otherwise you're getting out into the, the you know, lane of the traffic. So those are some suggestions that you might try to factor in and if they're acceptable to other people and, you know, it's a framework. Uh, and then I just had one other stupid question, which is when you talk about floating houses, if somebody came along and they had their little yacht in the middle of Lake Joe and it's camped out, you know, and they have living accommodations in the yacht or a very large boat that, which they seem to have these days out there and they want to park out there at 400 feet off my dock, are they allowed to do that? So, so quickly through the chair, just so that everyone's abundantly clear on the swim rafts, what the ministry is proposing is a maximum of 15 square meters for residential use and 40 square meters for commercial use. So they've already distinguished between the two. I think oh Councilor God. Kent's suggestion of a maximum of 15 by 15, that's over 200 square feet. The 15 square meters is actually less than that. So they're proposing- no, 15 feet, it. sorry, 15 feet, uh, Director Pink is what I was suggesting. I, Five meters. Apologies. I thought you suggested 15 by 15. No, 15 by 15 feet. I'm sorry. I'm giving you a much more reason, reasoned approach. <laughs> Five um, meters. Uh, in any event, the it's 15 square meters as they're proposing, which is, again, approximately 150, 160 square feet. I, again, if committee wishes to reduce that, uh, that's certainly your prerogative. Um, with respect to the question on length out, you know, certainly 50 feet might be a reasonable number in a lot of instances, but I think what you'll find, that's one of the great unique things about working in Muskoka Lakes. In some cases you'll slide off a raft into six inches of water at 50 feet out. And that's the difficulty uh, with a one size fits all regulation or zoning by our official plan in our township. But if you wish to include uh, that number um, or any number, certainly uh, staff will forward that uh, to the ministry. And lastly, to the question, uh, that is correct. If uh, I think right now one could essentially dock uh, or park or moor uh, essentially a house over water that's uh, a vessel in front, this regulation would prohibit that. But I think it would still continue to permit a houseboat or a yacht that's specifically intended for that type of purpose. Yes, one could go on our lakes and uh, dock in front of properties. But at least these regulations would ensure that it moves every seven days, it moves at least a kilometer away, and it's not within 300 meters of your docker boathouse, and potentially 300 meters of your developed property is, is my suggestion. So I think these regulations, I think, are definitely a move in the right direction. I echo the, the mayor's comments. Enforcement may be challenging, and that's why I want to ensure that it's, it's clear that it's on the ministry. Um, but I think there's a lot of eyes and ears out there that uh, they will hear if people contravene. And I, I hope they will have the resources. Uh, they are the Ministry of Natural Resources to uh, to enforce. So, thank you, okay, Director. Thank you. Can I can I just I would suggest if you, given what you said that I would definitely put in some reduced numbers. And I don't know if anybody else agrees with me. Maybe we could discuss that. But I think the size of the swim docks they're suggesting are massive. Uh, any other comments on the size? And that I think, uh, and that 15 square meters sounds like a lot. That's what 10 by 15 feet. 15 square meters, approximately 160 square feet. 61, that's a, that's a big swim raft. That's like putting a room out there. So we had a, a 12 by 12 and it was way bigger than it needed to be um it just, and it worked just fine for years and years and years and until the wake borders started breaking the anchor chains yeah and you'll get that so feet or feet or meters feet a 12 by 12 feet is that's massive. Right. okay that's what i was suggesting was 15 feet by 15 feet we're not trying to that's, 15 that's, meters. Even, that's, that's even too large that's larger than uh, 
than what they're proposing. Sorry. Just a, we have order, please. Councilor Nishikawa, you want to comment? Thank you. Could I just suggest 10 by 10? And um, I, I, we can argue about this, but from my perspective, this isn't our issue. We're, we're being asked to comment and yes, but I don't, I don't honestly believe that they're going to, they're read it, but I don't think they're going to incorporate it because the, the problems are not necessarily in our township at this time. These are bigger Georgian Bay issues, but, and I respect everyone's concerns and things, but I also recognize how government works. And so let's put the 10 by 10 in there, but in fact, it's not our problem. Yes, sorry, I'm sorry. Yes, exactly, 10 by 10 feet. So Figure that one out, David, sorry. Oh, yes, work that down to, to meters, uh, three meters by three meters, which is nine, nine square meters, is that right? I'm sure I can, I can figure this out. Yeah, I would go nine square meters. I, I, the other is, and that, and th th it's the same with the 40. That's a that's a building out on the water. Well, I always give give people the the, the right to speak. Okay. I can adjust the resolution if if that's the consensus of maximum. 10 by 10, I'm confident I can do the conversion after. Um, okay, th thank the, you. Yeah, no, I, can, I can change the resolution. Okay, now I have read. Uh, just as amended. So as amended, you can put it down. We, we should amend it with another resolution though, not chicken scratch that. Oh. Okay, then I'll need another. So, okay. yeah. Just, just want to change the. On a few minutes, and nine square meters. Okay. Let me give it to you. We're just going to convert a figure, and then we'll be good to go. Okay. And since there's just a, a Ontario Land Tribunal update after this, uh, we won't break for lunch at this time. We'll just go right through if that everyone is agreeable. Yep. Should do that now, and David can do his work. Okay, uh, so that would be Mr. Sharp then on land. Any land tribunal updates? Uh. Through you, Chair, I, I'm not aware of any updates. Uh, Mr. Pink, did you have anything that uh, you wanted to add? Uh, Mr. Chair, again, as previous committee meetings, this uh, is a placeholder on the agenda. Just if any uh, committee members have any questions on ongoing OLT matters, uh, planning staff are here to respond. Are there any any uh, questions on anything? Uh, any new new business? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and through you, I've, I've, I'm just going to try and get a couple things on public record. So the first is um, I've noticed uh, over the past couple of years uh, differences in frontage. So I'm I'm going to ask the question of planning staff: How is frontage determined in the waterfront? Is it assessed frontage or straight line frontage for a severance? Is it assessed frontage or straight line frontage for a two-story boathouse? because I've seen it waffling back and forth. And uh, it always used to be done on straight line frontage and assessed frontage seems to be creeping into planning applications when it is beneficial to the applicant. Uh, and I'm, I'm just looking for uh, definitive on how we do it. And if that has to come back to another meeting, I'm okay with that, but I just, I want it on the, on the, on the record. Mm -hmm. Mr. Sharp, would you like to answer that? Through you, Chair Edwards, and uh, thank you for your question, uh, Councillor Burry. Um, the zoning bylaw requires lot frontage to be measured in a straight line. So in situations where a property has uh, less than the required frontage, be it for a severance or a two-story boathouse, there would be a requirement to um, gain an exemption from the necessary frontage requirement through a zoning bylaw amendment application 
or alternatively through relief uh, granted by way of a minor variance application. I think what you're referring to is, is um, uh, sometimes we receive uh, applications, for example, to permit a two-story boathouse, for example, on a property that has um, uh, that, that consists of a peninsula. So um, in these particular situations, typically what you see is a, a rear lot line and a front lot line. And the straight line frontage measurement goes from where um, the rear lot line intersects the high water mark on each side. And the frontage measurement in that case would be measured typically less than 300 feet um, for a two-story boathouse. But at the same time, the property has significant actual or assessed frontage. In other words, the frontage that the property is being um, assessed for for tax purposes. So, you know, for example, the assessed frontage could be upwards of 900 feet, whereas the straight line frontage is much less. So in those cases, you know, that owner may um, submit a uh, zoning bylaw amendment application for an exemption from the frontage and staff would look at the, you know, the, the property characteristics it would note the extensive frontage. Um, in the current official plan, um, the, the, the current official plan doesn't uh, define how lot frontage is measured. So there is um, some flexibility for staff to look at, you know, those site specific considerations where a property may have, you know, a significant um, actual or assessed frontage relative to its, its straight line frontage. But I would note that um, the adopted official plan in other words, the official plan that hasn't yet been approved does contain policy that specifically states that the lot frontage is to be measured as per the township zoning bylaw um, in a straight line fashion. So it eliminates this discrepancy. Um, so hopefully that uh, helps provide some clarity and context. Thank you. Uh, that's terrific. Thank you. I do. The second one is um, pools. And um, we're starting to see more and more pools, outdoor pools being constructed. And I'm wondering why they're not subject to a building permit when they have plumbing. Um, my concern is for the environment. Uh, pools are either typically salt water or chlorine, occasionally bromine, um, chemicals that don't typically work well with lake water. And I'm wondering why we're seeing um, pools being able to be constructed as long as they're 66 feet back that don't have any any kind of issues with plumbing when you can't uh, add a bathroom in into a, a dwelling without a building permit uh, because of the 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 need for um, for for plumbing and, and sewage and sewage inspection. So I'm just wondering what we need to do to contemplate the fact that um, more people are likely to put in pools because if one person has them, then the other person wants to get them. And, I, and I'm wondering what kind of mechanisms we have to kind of safeguard our lakes uh, from discharge of pools directly into lakes. Thank you. Who would like to answer that? Mr. Pink? Uh, do my best. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't know if Mr. Snyder uh, is on the uh, on the call. He may wish to expand further. I don't uh, necessarily an expert on the Ontario Building Code, but all I can say is unless it's a commercial pool, the Ontario Building Code does not require a building permit for a pool. Um, actually, I'm not sure if um, uh, if the clarity is there, but uh, pools should not, I'm fairly confident, not be hooked up to your servicing. Um, so therefore, again, hence the need not for a building permit as it doesn't influence uh, the sewage disposal system uh, and it's not a, a building uh, per se. Um, short of uh, lobbying or advocating to the province to amend the building code, um, one of the tools we used, uh, I'm sorry to back up, really, I think what really remains is the large issue is the proper and safe disposal of that pool water when it's uh, disposed of, whether there's chemicals or salt water. And what we had started to do um, when pools uh, began to gain a bit more popularity is through the site plan approval process, we worked with uh, building staff and other municipalities to come up with a uh, uh, a good set of best practices uh, as to disposal of pool water, uh, when it's to occur, the steps you must take, where it should be disposed of. And uh, we uh, included that in a number of site plan agreements over the years. Uh, unfortunately, now with Bill 23, we've we've lost uh, that control. Um, however, if uh, somewhat of a unique um, 
situation. Tennis courts are similar. Um, I'm sure committee knows about our tree preservation and site alteration bylaws. Uh, they all work on the premise of obtaining site plan approval or a building permit. Obviously pools and tennis courts, now we don't have site plan and you don't need a building permit. Um, so they fall into a bit of a black hole, um, but what works well is really uh, most pools are gonna either require tree removal and in their essence, essentially have to alter grade. So really any new pool uh, today uh, really should obtain a site alteration uh, at a minimum or a tree preservation or tree removal permit. And through that process, uh, we can try to duplicate um, what we did through the site plan approval process to ensure that um, disposal of pool water is done appropriately. So hopefully, um, uh, again, through that process, the, uh, any concerns are addressed. Fortunately, as with most things, it, it comes down to enforcement though, and uh, ensuring the owners actually fall through on their obligations. So what's stipulated in their site plan or their uh, tree removal permit, uh, but we will do our, our best to, to do that. Really, again, if, if you wanna talk more high level and maybe I should have started with this, at the end of the day, our, our official plan contemplates accessory uses along our waterfront. So we allow things such as tennis courts, sport courts, uh, garages, gazebos, and pools. If this is a significant concern to uh, to council, um, we'd probably be looking at you know an official plan amendment to consider a prohibition on pools if, if the concern was that significant. Uh, but for now, they, they are permitted. Um, and it's about getting the right controls in place to ensure that uh, they're put in properly and, and the waste and the the water is disposed of properly, not just dumped into the lake. Thank you uh, very much, David. That was terrific. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? All good. Thank you. Uh, yes, Councilor Nishikawa. Topic. Sorry about that. <laughs> um, well, no, because along with that, and 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 David, I, I guess I'm. I just can't draw the information from my overloaded brain at the moment. I guess, but. Um, what about blasting though? So it was interesting, you, we were talking about tree removal and, and but in my experience, it's also a lot involving blasting. Um, same with the tennis courts, right? And you know, I watched one tennis court go up and they blasted for two months long. Um, so, you know, I, I get the whole blasting thing, but I, I do wonder, is there still an opportunity for us to, be involved with those pools because of, of a blasting element. Uh, through the chair, I, I think the really for now the the answer is again it's it's a permitted use. So if an application came in for a tree removal permit or a site alteration permit, I think staff would have limited ability to say no, provided the pool complied with setbacks. But what I would note is in the adopted official plan, what I I was really pushing for and has been included in the official plan is to look at the alteration of property more holistically. Right now, under our current official plan, it's really premised entirely around lot coverage. And that's really the main control to, uh, to limit the disturbance of a site. In the new official plan, it looks at things like patio areas, pools, sport courts, driveways, septic systems, and looks to put a greater control on the amount of alteration that's permitted on one's property. So to answer your question, I think you'll have an opportunity once hopefully the new official plan is approved by the district and in effect, staff will be bringing the site alteration bylaw back to you to actually start putting some controls on the quantity of site alteration that's permitted. Uh, because currently, again, the official plan, the zoning allows in essence, an unlimited amount of accessory type of amenity space and use. Uh, the controls are lot coverage. A lot of these uses that we have concern with, like pools, sport courts, they don't have roofs, so they're not captured in that. Uh, so I think the controls are slowly um, being put in place and those concerns will be addressed. Um, but for now, uh, again, pools are permitted and you're correct in most instances likely would require some blasting to install in our township. Thank you. Thank you, David. Is there any uh, other new uh, business that anyone has? I'll just go back to the other resolution here. Moved by Councillor Burry, second by Mayor Kelly, be it resolved that staff report plan 2023-62, consider the resolution be amended as follows. The surface area of a swim rafts must be equal to or less than 9.3 square meters for private non-commercial uses. 
Any questions or comments? All those in favor? And that is carried. And so I don't have a resolution to adjourn. Just you don't have a resolution. Thinking, you figured we were going all day, did you? I just realized just two seconds. I don't have a one to adjourn. There wasn't one in the package, so yeah. If you could lift one up, that'd be awesome. We're just waiting for a resolution to, to be printed so we can, uh, whoops, careful. And you can read this, but that needs to say April. She's got it locked over there. So. It'll have to say March. The next regular planning meeting is April 13th. Okay. So you can read. Okay, I'm going to read. I, excuse me. I'm going to read the resolution. Move by. Can't use that one. Yeah, that's fine. Just uh, Councillor Burry. Okay, Councillor Burry. Second by Councillor Roberts. We have resolved the planning committee meeting adjourned at 1226 a.m. p.m. And the next regular planning Committee meeting will be held Thursday, February Thursday, April the thirteenth at nine a.m. electronically from the council chambers, municipal office of Port Carling, Ontario. All those in favor? Yes. 